All right, my friends. I just pressed the let's go live button. And so we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the internet before we go ahead and get started. Let's make sure the tubes are working and that we've got a nice FPS, a nice frames per second. Looking like that's pretty good. We got the rumble. Looks like that's kicking. We got locals. Looks like that's alive. And our friends over on the YouTubes. Seems like it's working. That's tremendous. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about Donald Trump's removal in Colorado. And this is a big one. Of course, this broke on the show yesterday, and there is a lot to unpack here. We got three full segments breaking down this historic opinion that came out of the Colorado Supreme Court. And we're going to unpack the full opinion today. It's a big one. You can see I've got the full thing queued up here. We're going to hit the highlights. It's over 200 pages, but a big portion of it is the dissent. And so we're going to hit the main opinion and then deconstruct it because there's a lot to talk about. But we're going to go through and just remind ourselves that, you know, this is happening even though there has been no finding of insurrection anywhere. Donald Trump was not indicted for it. He was indicted for four other charges. He was not impeached for it. In fact, he was acquitted there after they tried to get him under HR 24. And then we also know that they're trying to indict him in other locations and, and other prosecutions, and they haven't found insurrection at all. But nonetheless, Colorado has decided that they're going to disenfranchise over 1.3 million people who voted for Trump last time. And that's going to be an interesting thing. So we're going to unpack exactly what's happening there. We're going to go through the full opinion. We're going to hear from Jenna Griswold, who is the Colorado Secretary of State. And we're also going to hear from the lawyers who worked on the case to get it removed. This guy is named Sean Grimsley, and he showed up on uh, Caitlin Collins' show on CNN and said that, you know, we've got a pretty good chance of getting this thing successfully litigated at the Supreme Court. And so we're going to go and take a look at what's happening there. Turley also had a reaction saying that there's going to be a big slippery slope here, and I certainly agree. And then we'll jump into the second segment where we see what's happening in other states, because as we predicted, there's going to be a domino effect here. We're going to see a bunch of people suddenly try to make the same moves. California is not skipping a beat. They're already jumping right into this. The lieutenant governor, her name is Eleni Kulanakis, she has already initiated an investigation to try to figure out what they can do in California to get Trump off the ballot there. And then this is a summary from X showing all of the other locations where this is happening. OK, we've got Colorado. We already know that they're going to be trying this in multiple different locations. And Mario Nafal is the person who assembled a list of all the other removal efforts. So we'll see what's happening there. Frank Luntz went on CNN and he admitted that poll numbers are going to be going up for Trump. And that makes sense because every time they indict him, the same thing happens. We also have John Bolton, you know, broken clock can be right twice a day. And here's John Bolton saying, you know, this Colorado thing's a pretty bad decision. Raskin is coming out, making some claims. We're going to hear from the Democrats on the left. And then we're going to hear from the right. We're going to see what both sides are saying. Judge Luddig came out, said this was a masterful decision. And so did Shifty Schiff, Senator Coons, and Morning Joe is saying, if you don't agree with this, you might be a part of the Confederacy, which I, I don't know if that's uh, different than the, the Third Reich or whatever, but you know, it's a, it's a different uh, a different label. So this is Jim Jordan. He's also reacting to this. We've got J.D. Vance in the Senate, and Matt Gates has a comment on this as well. Before we jump into the presidential reaction, because Joe Biden came out, and he is now saying this openly, that, that Donald Trump is guilty, essentially, of insurrection. He says there's no question about this. Donald Trump is absolutely an insurrectionist. And that's interesting because, you know, he runs the DOJ and the DOJ is prosecuting his political opponent. And so he's now articulating to the entire country that the executive branch has a position on this. And so the executive branch is going to go after him and he's just, you know, it's open now. It's not even like hiding it. It's not even like, well, let's let this play out in court. It's just like, oh, he's definitely an insurrectionist and he needs to be removed from 
power. And this is an interesting exchange because it feels like a setup question. He kind of walks right to this reporter, answers a question, and he, he doesn't know anything. It's really a, kind of a pathetic clip, but we'll hear from him. We'll also see what the 2024 candidates have to say about this. The Vake is out and he's putting out an ultimatum. He says, look, if Trump is not on the ballot, then I'm going to be objecting in Colorado. And there's going to be a lot from him. We also want to check in with Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, see if they have anything to say about any of this. And then Donald Trump also issued a campaign response. We've got reaction from the Colorado GOP. We've got reaction from Speaker Mike Johnson. And then Trump posted a couple things about this on his true social platform. And then lastly, we've got this is the lieutenant governor from Texas. He's saying, you know, if Joe Biden and the Democrats are playing these shenanigans, in various parts of the country. Why don't we just do it in our state too? Why don't we just take Joe off the ballot in Texas? Because of course he's insurrecting the country by allowing an invasion every day to the tune of tens of thousands of people a week coming across. So we're gonna get into all of that and more my friends. And I'm grateful that you are here and joining us. It is a beautiful, beautiful day. We had a great members only stream this morning. We talked about three segments this morning. We talked about senators, including Mitch McConnell, he is defending Donald Trump. He says, you know, Donald Trump doesn't have any problems with blood because he appointed my wife. And we also heard from Senator J.D. Vance, who said the same thing. He says, you know, they are, in fact, poisoning American blood. They're doing it with fentanyl. That's what's causing people to die. Because do you understand, AP journalist reporter, when you have a high concentration of fentanyl in your system, it's gonna cause havoc on your body and you're gonna die. So that's also literally what's happening because fentanyl is coming across and getting into the blood. So we talked about that. We talked about the Epstein trial records. Now, these videos will all be coming out, so you can catch those later. But if you're a member, you get to join these uh, when we do them in the morning. But we also went through the Epstein ruling. We know that we covered a lot of the Epstein trial here on the channel and uh, more records are gonna be unsealed. I'm not real excited about what's inside of them. You'll watch the video and you'll explain a lot of headlines, Epstein, Epstein, it's not, you know, we'll see. I'm hopeful, I mean, maybe there's something good in there, but I'm not so sure, I think we've already seen it. And then Garland subpoenaed, was subpoenaed by Jim Jordan because Garland was spying on Senate staffers. And we talked about all of those on our members only stream this morning. And so you can become a member on YouTube or you can join us at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is where we do those member streams. We do Saturday shows. We have an amazing community. And we got some good stuff cooking over there. So check us out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We also have our website, robertgovea.com. We've got a daily newsletter. If you want to get any access to the mind map or to the PDF files, Robert Govea is the place to do that. So you can go there, check that out. We've also got our brand new shop. And the, sh the shirt of the day I think based on this Colorado ruling, the one that the word of the day is ungovernable. All right. So we've got this available at robertgovea.com slash shop and all the various sizes. You can see it's ungovernable. Very simple statement that you can send out there on the shop. And we also have the hat. We have the flip flop and Hillary Clinton sandals. We got the flip flop and Joe Biden sandals. You can learn more about what the watcher symbol means what went into this design. You can just read about it here. It's Lady Justice, it's Justicia, it's, it's the sword that cuts through the bonds of ignorance and the shield, which allows us to identify each other out there in battle. And so check it out, robertgovea.com slash shop. All right, and let's get into it, my friends, because we've got some meatballs to unpack here. Starting with Colorado. The Colorado Supreme Court kicks Trump off the ballot. And unfortunately, I think this is just the beginning, unless the Supreme Court steps in and does something pretty aggressively to knock this nonsense off to save American democracy. But in this case, the Colorado Supremes decided it was in their purview to disenfranchise over 1.3 million Coloradans who presumably are gonna go out and vote for Donald Trump. They said, you don't have that right anymore. We're Democrats, we believe in democracy unless you get the opportunity to vote for somebody that we don't like. And this is a shocking opinion, one of the most troubling opinions I think we've ever actually covered on this channel, and we've covered a lot of them. But we're gonna go through the full ruling from the Colorado Supreme Court and then get reaction from the lawyers who worked on the case and the Secretary of State and others. But remember that there has been no finding of insurrection against Donald Trump. 
Not in the indictment, not in the impeachment resolution at all. Remember, this is what the indictment charged Trump with. There were four crimes. And if you see seditious conspiracy or insurrection in here, please let me know. I haven't been able to find it. Count one is conspiracy to defraud the United States. Oh, a conspiracy charge. Oh, another conspiracy charge. About what? Obstruction. Okay. We also have actual obstruction, which is another not insurrection charge. And then we have a conspiracy against rights charge, which we think they should be charged with. But the point is no insurrection in the indictment. Okay. So the Justice Department presumably reviewed the case, didn't find it was there, and didn't bring the charge. So why can Colorado just presume that there's been a conviction on that or that this has already been conclusively defined? Well, because they just decided they wanted to do that. But as, ter as, it, as far as federal law goes, he has not been indicted for it at all. And moreover, he still has not even been impeached on this because remember the second impeachment that was brought under H. Res. 24 actually did charge Trump with insurrection, okay? This was their bite at the apple. This was the moment that they were supposed to get rid of Trump. They put him on trial already and they lost, which is why they're trying to do it again and again and again. But you don't get to do it as many times as you want until you get a conviction. So remember, this is what this one said, HR 24 in the Senate, saying that we are impeaching Donald Tr John Trump for high crimes and misdemeanor, why? Incitement of insurrection, okay? So he was charged with this. We have something in this country called double jeopardy, and he was charged here. They said that the Constitution provides under the 14th Amendment, okay, the same issue that we're litigating in Colorado, which has already been litigated right here, said that Donald Trump violated his constitu constitutional duty by inciting violence against the government of the United States. And that's a pretty interesting standard there because people might say, you know, Kamala Harris did that when she was donating to the Minneapolis bond funds to have people who burnt down the third precinct in Minneapolis released on bond. Okay, they actually incited violence. Maybe it wasn't against the government of the United States. Maybe it was against the government of Minneapolis, but you get the point. So on January 6th, they say Donald Trump met and shortly before he said, we won, we won it by a landslide. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Okay. This is already part of an original charging document. They said that he interfered and his conduct on January 6th was something that was problematic. He instructed Raffensperger to find the votes. And then he demonstrated that he's a threat to national security. Okay. This stupid document was signed by Nancy Pelosi. And Cheryl Johnson, the clerk, signed off on it too. So we've already litigated this. Guess what? Donald Trump had this brought in front of him. We went through due process. The left likes to howl about that. And then they went into the Senate and he was acquitted. So now they want to do it again, right? Now, since all of the other mechanisms has failed, now since he's already been indicted four times, they're trying to take away his business with Tishy Latish James. They're trying to defame him out of oblivion with Miss Bergdorf, who got Bergdorf allegedly, never happened. And the list goes on and on. And so now we have the Colorado Supreme Court, and this is something that really hurts, I mean, in American political life in jurisprudence for the foreseeable future, you know, you can compare and contrast this ruling against the Trump indictments. Look, you're always going to have hack prosecutors, okay, who are partisan and political. And we've got that. We've had that in Washington for years. We get that all the time. We know what a corrupt district like Washington, D.C., the D.C. circuit looks like. That's not a surprise to anybody. So the fact that they go to the World Criminal Court and just, you know, pull Jack Smith out of some, you know, pod somewhere and then inject him into the American political life and just say, go get him. Doesn't matter. Forget the Constitution, whatever. Go get him. We understand that mechanic. And Judge Chuckin will rubber stamp him. And we always rely on the higher level courts to reintroduce some, some normalcy, okay? Some sense of sanity to the things that we do. That's why we have the Courts of Appeals because it's supposed to get more sane as you go up. And we're going to see if that happens or not. But in this case, the opposite has actually happened, right? This is far removed from Washington, D.C. This is a whole separate state, one of 50 that we have. This is a group of four judges, not just one, right? This is not brought by a hack political prosecutor. This is brought by, brought by a private interest group, okay? Meaning that anybody can just go pay for somebody to file a lawsuit as long as you have the right issue in front of the right people. 
you might get some judges somewhere to do it, right? And this is four judges at the highest court who have a, a sworn obligation to uphold and protect and defend the Constitution, all in the name of the, the constitutional republic on which we are built. But they have decided, the four of them, to literally disenfranchise 1.36 million people who voted for Trump last time. Those people will not get to vote for him again if this stands. And the idea that they would do something like that is so antithetical to democracy. It's, it's I think, a much bigger blow than anything we've ever seen before, quite frankly, on this channel, because it is just the scope of this. And what this does, as we've already predicted, is it em emphasizes the ability of other courts to find the same way. They can say it's persuasive authority and they can just pick over what Colorado did and use it as cover. And so it is a reprehensible day, a reprehensible opinion. I think that we're all Coloradans now, right? They came for Colorado. They're going to come for the other states. And this is literally the judicial class. It is the Democrats not even playing around anymore, right? It, it's just taking it away from the people. And I want to think about this in reverse. If they're going to sit here and take this away from us right now, what do you think they did in 2020 when you were challenging it on the other side? right? You're challenging it in the courts. The courts just say, we're not going to hear your claims. You think they give it the time of day at all? I don't. Because if they're willing to do this, it shows what they're willing to do elsewhere. So without any further ado, let's get into the opinion so we can really break it down. This is what it looks like coming out of one of the most anti-democratic and one of the most disgusting opinions I think we've ever seen ever, which is stripping the right to vote for a candidate away from the people in America, in one of our states, you don't get to vote for the person you voted for last time because four judges just decided it. Wild, wild times ahead. But this is what the judge and these, uh, these legal scholars write. They say, in this appeal from a district court proceeding, we now consider whether Donald Trump may appear on the Colorado Republican presidential primary ballot. Now, a majority of the courts hold that President Trump of this court holds that Trump is disqualified from holding office under the 14th Amendment. And because he is disqualified, it would be wrong to list him on the ballot. Now, a big asterisk here. The court stays its ruling until January 4th, subject to any further appellate proceedings. Now, there are a lot of caveats in this, and there's a lot of different ways this thing, I think, can go. But if you really want to get hyper-technical, you could say, well, if it's all going to be stayed, is anything going to change at all? Let's zoom in and see what's inside. So as you can see, the case comes from the Supreme Court of the state of Colorado. It is brought by the crew organization, and we have a bunch of different people involved. Not only the people who wanted to get Trump removed, which is this group of people, we've also got the Colorado Secretary of State and the Colorado Republican State Central Committee, along with Donald Trump. And so there's a bunch of different issues here, and we're going to try to hit the highlights on what's happening. Tons of attorneys. This has been working its way up to the Supreme Court. And we've covered this from the beginning, starting with Judge Sarah B. Wallace at the lower level district court. And so it, it begins with a little bit of a background here. Where do we begin? More than three months ago, a group of Colorado electors who are eligible to vote, both registered Republicans and others filed to get Trump off the ballot. Now, invoking the provisions of the electoral code, they said that Trump's name on the primary ballot, they said he was disqualified under the 14th Amendment. Now, after permitting Trump to, to intervene, we had a five-day trial, which we covered extensively here. And the lower level court found that there were two prongs. One, whether Trump engaged in insurrection, and the judge said, yes, he did. But the second prong said did not apply, right? He committed an insurrection, but the second, the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to the presidency, therefore Trump is not removed. But they say, wrong. We affirm in part and we reverse in part. And we hold the following, that the election code allows electors to challenge Trump's status based on section three. They say this is their only viable means of litigating this. And so this is the only mechanism, the only action they can bring. So you know, almost, almost as a technical procedural mechanism, this is the right way to do it. Congress, they say, wow, Congress does not need to pass implementing legislation for Section 3 to attach. And it is 
self-executing. Okay, so the previous prongs on the mind map that I showed you about the indictment doesn't matter because it just executes itself. It just, we can just decide, right? In other words, a secretary of state at a local state level can just execute this. Just, I, I, you know, in other words, I think this is some, something that happened and it's self-executed. Congress doesn't need to impeach him and convict him. In fact, even if you're acquitted, okay, in Congress, even if they try you and acquit you, they can still just self-execute it, right? So judicial review of Trump's eligibility for office is not precluded by the political question doctrine. And the political question doctrine is this idea, you know, you can't go sue your government because you hate taxes. It'd be nice if you could, but you can't. They just say, well, if you hate taxes, just go vote for somebody. That's why we live in a democratic republic, a constitutional republic. And by weaponizing all the political questions, you kind of wreck that. So they say, no, it's not a political question. This is a, a legitimate question. Trump can be thrown off the ballot. They tell us section three encompasses the office of the presidency. Now we're going to zoom in on each of these, but section three does cover Trump. He took an oath. And so Judge Sarah B. Wallace, who I think was right, was wrong. The district court did not abuse its discretion by admitting the January 6th report into evidence. They conducted their own little show trial. The district court did not err by defining an insurrection and, and de declaring that this constituted an insurrection. And also Trump engaged in an insurrection and the First Amendment does not protect Donald Trump's speech. So it's just like the lottery ticket for Democrats. It's like, wow, everything is, is going in their favor. What an incredible opinion. Now, the sum of these parts is this. All added up, the Supreme Court of Colorado says, President Trump is disqualified from holding the office under Section 3 because he's disqualified. And it would be wrong under the law to then list him if he is disqualified. Now, one of the most disgusting opinions out of a terrible uh, court has said, all right, I got to hold on a second. I got to log back in on this. Uh, YouTube just booted me out because I'm in the middle of a stream. Uh, you know, it likes to do that for whatever reason. Okay, let's see if we're getting logged back in so we can see the our YouTube friends. YouTube just likes to, you know, you have this back-end dashboard. When you're in the middle of a stream, it just logs you out so that you can't see anything. And it, you know, it just decides, oh, oh, you're streaming right now? What do you need access to your dashboard for? You're logged out. Thanks, guys. All right, so we're back. Now, the court says, we do not reach these conclusions lightly. Sure, I'm sure you didn't. I'm sure you guys really contemplated time and again and really had difficulty ruling this. And you say, we are mindful of the magnitude and the weight of the questions that are now before us. And we're likewise mindful of our solemn duty to apply the law without fear or favor, without being swayed by public reaction to the decisions that the law mandates that we reach. Now, I got a lot of questions for who these four people are and what, you know, what type of pressure came down to bear upon them, all seven of them, quite frankly, right? You take a, a look at the political pressures in this country and who is leveraging what to get these rulings. Good question. Now, they say we're also cognizant that we travel in uncharted territory and that this case presents a several issues of first impression. But for our resolution of this law, the secretary, but for our resolution of this challenge, the secretary would be required to put Trump on the ballot. And so this is an interesting paragraph. They say, therefore, to maintain the status quo pending any review by the U.S. Supreme Court, we stay our ruling. OK, so this thing is now entered, but it's on hold. It's stayed all the way up until January 4th. And we know that in Colorado, they vote for the president in the primary on March 4th, the day before uh, March 5th, I think, is Super Tuesday. And the January 6th trial was scheduled for March 4th, if you remember that. So if the review is sought, if review is sought in the Supreme Court before the stay expires, then the stay shall remain in place and the secretary will continue to be required to include President Trump's name on the 2024 presidential primary ballot until the receipt of any order or mandate from the Supreme Court. 
What? Yeah, oh, gosh. So you're not even going to stand by it, you weak little pathetic anti-democratic judges? So what they're going to say is that the secretary will continue to be required to keep Trump on the ballot. And as long as he's appealing it, and so as long as they get something filed and the Supreme Court doesn't issue a ruling one way or the other, nothing's going to change. The status quo is going to be the same. So it's a very sneaky opinion, you know, and it really has a lot of contingencies to it. So they could have just, you know, said it and then delegated it up to the Supreme Court. But what the way this reads to me is that they have some skepticism about this. They're like, I'm not sure what the Supreme Court is going to do on this. So we don't actually want to make the changes. Like we're making the changes. We're ruling that we're going to make the changes. And then we're not actually going to do them because we kind of think the Supreme Court might mess this up. So it is kind of spineless, right? It's spineless on multiple different levels because they're not actually doing it, but they are doing it. So it's typical for a bunch of Democrats. Now, here's the background. On November 8th, President Trump was elected. We know that. Joe Biden, in 2020, they allege he was elected, which I still think was rigged. On January 6th, they say the Electoral College meant Trump said fight like hell, everything happened, we know the rest of it. Now, the procedural history, we'll fast forward through that. We know how we got to the Supreme Court because we have been here for quite some time. We've been following this case for a while out of Colorado. So now they're going to bring us to the analysis. Question is about Section 3, the 14th Amendment, the Insurrection Clause. They want to go through an overview on this and explain how it works. They say the end of the Second War brought what we called a second founding of America. And we passed a bunch of rules, including the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says that here, no person shall be a senator or representative or elector a vice president or hold any office, okay, just as a reminder, any office of civil military who have previously taken oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or state legislature or executive judicial officer or any of the others, if they shall have engaged in insurrection against the country. But Congress, by may a vote of two thirds of each house, removed the disability. Okay, and we've read this many times here, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But the lower level co court, Judge Sarah B. Wallace said that this does not apply to the president. Otherwise, they would have just said president. Now, in interpreting a constitutional provision, they say, we want to really understand it. If the language is clear and unambiguous, then we, have some in then we can just read it. But now, we don't really know what this means. And so, they're going to walk us through. And so, now we say, the principles of interpretation apply to this, and we're trying to address the meaning of that provision. So, let's see how they do it. They say, first of all, the state has the right to challenge this. We have jurisdiction and, you know, this is the proper claim stuff. And so we're going to fast forward through this. One of Trump's arguments was that it shouldn't be in this court because this, this, this is not even a type of case that these courts can hear. Now, presidential primaries, they say before addressing these things, we want you to know that we know the rules about how the primaries are conducted in Colorado. The election code limits it to qualified candidates, okay? You can't be eight years old and run for president. Got it. So section uh, of this law says the following, and any challenges are brought through this st special statutory procedure, which, you know, it's very technical and boring, blah, blah, blah. Section this allows you to do this. And in other words, all of these crew people, the people who are filing the removal suit, did it right. Now, Trump argued that they lacked jurisdiction over this, but we don't think so. We think that we do have jurisdiction and it doesn't affect any, any other Trump claims. And so we're allowed to hear this case because the states have the authority to assess the candidates' qualifications and they did the proper mechanism to get here. But does the constitution also authorize states to assess the constitutional qualifications of candidates? we conclude that it does. So the Constitution gives these people the right to qualify whether people can go on the ballot and no party, they say, has said that they can't limit on age or residency or citizenship, right? So in other words, Trump's people are saying, the secretary can boot you out if you're eight or boot you out if you're not a resident or boot you out if you're not a citizen. So clearly they can also boot you out if they just decide you're an insurrectionist. 
Now, as then Judge Gorsuch recognized, they said that he said that this is also appropriate. Now, it's a proper claim and it's not precluded. And so we can hear the case. All of it is jurisdictional stuff. And so we can skip right over it because obviously the court finds they have jurisdiction given the fact that they heard the case. Now, they say if we limit Trump's ballot access, it doesn't infringe on First Amendment rights with the local Republican entity. And here, this has been adequate due process. Okay, so it's all procedural stuff. And by performing the petition the way that the crew people filed it, they've met all of the procedural stuff. Now, let's get to section C. They say the disqualification provision now attaches without congressional action. This is a key point. We had questions, is the 14th Amendment and the insurrection clause automatically executing? Or does there need to be a finding? Does Donald Trump actually need to be impeached and then convicted in the Senate, for example, which he was not? Does he need to actually be indicted and charged with an insurrection crime, which he was not? Or can some bureaucrat in a secretary of state's office just make the decision? Well, it turns out SCOTUS, or here, Colorado, CODIS, says so, that, they, that they can. We have here the electors challenge the secretary's ability to certify that Trump is removed by calling it self-executing. They say Congress has not authorized state courts to enforce Section 3. They're saying we disagree with Trump and his arguments. They write, the only mention of congressional power in Section 3 is that Congress may by a vote of two thirds remove the disqualification. So in other words, Congress is not even involved in this. Section three does not determine who decides whether the qualification is attached in the first place. So like it doesn't say who does it. Now, one would infer that if the house can remove it, then the house is the entity that can add it, right? They are the people who can impeach and the Senate can convict, and then they could, by two thirds of a vote, remove the disqualification. But they disagree with that. The Supreme Court has said that the 14th Amendment is undoubtedly self-executing so far as its terms are applicable to any existing state circumstances. And they reference the civil rights cases back from 1883 for that, right? So I guess every part of this is just self-executing. And so to be sure, the court directly focuses on the 13th Amendment in those cases, which is not what we're in. And they say, so this statement could be described as dicta, which means it's not relevant. Okay, dicta is just meaningless additional stuff that's not relevant, right? What happens in a, in a legal case is a main question comes up. Is Donald Trump allowed to be on the ballot? Yes or no. Like, and you answer that question and anything else like about something unrelated, right, would be dicta if you included it in the opinion. So what they're, what they're doing is, is wild. They're actually basing this on essentially dicta, right? They say, hey, we know the Supreme Court is self-executing. Why do we say that? Well, because it applies in the 13th Amendment. And we say, well, we're not in the 13th Amendment. Go one page over, one paragraph down to the 14th Amendment, and you'll see that that has nothing, that, that statement does not apply to the 14th, right? So it is dicta, meaning it's meaningless. It has no legal weight or authority. But, in, but they say, but still, we really, really liked that quote. Like we really needed it in there. We needed to reference a U.S. Supreme Court case. So we, dig it, we dug it out and threw it in there. But an examination of the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, so now our own non-precedential analysis is, and, and our interpretation, which is their subjective interpretation, supports the accuracy and the broader significance of the statement. Section three is one of four substantive sections of the 14th Amendment. They say section one says, uh, no state shall make or enforce, representatives shall, no person shall, and the validity of the public act shall. But section five is the provision that applies to each of these sub-provisions. And yet the Supreme Court has held that section one is self-executing. And section two was enacted to eliminate the constitutional compromise. The same is true for the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. 
And like the other Reconstruction Amendments, the 15th Amendment, which established universal male suffrage, contains a similar provision. And so they're looking around and just saying, this makes sense. You know, we think it matches the rest of these things. And both sides can play this game, by the way. So there is no textual evidence that Congress intended Section 3 to be any different. We agree that interpreting any of the Reconstruction Amendments would lead to absurd results. This has to match those things. And so if these amendments required legislation to make them operative, then Congress would nullify them by simply not passing enacting legislation. Now, the result of such an action would mean that slavery remains legal, you know? Black citizens could be counted as less than full citizens. And so they just go down the list, and it's, it's basically absurd. Now, interveners say that there's historical evidence that requires a different conclusion as to Section 3, right? Section 3 is not like those others. We generally turn to historic and other extrinsic evidence, but there's not here. They highlighted a bunch of statements, which we don't really care about. They directed us to a non-binding opinion by another case, which they don't care about. And interpreting the scope of this case, uh, we don't think it's applicable here. Now, this guy, Chief Justice Chase, made a bunch of statements, and they just go through those and d diminish those one by one. Now, we're similarly unpersuaded by Trump's assertions that Congress created the only currently available mechanism to determine whether somebody is disqualified with the passage of 18 U.S. Code 2383. Now, that is an actual crime, okay? Trump could have been charged with this. He was not. Assisting or engaging in a rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the United States. And they say, yeah, you know what? That's true. They passed that in 1994. They could have charged him with a crime for that. They said, true, with that enactment, Congress did criminalize the same conduct that is automatically disqualifying under Section 3. But all that means is that a person is charged and convicted would also be disqualified. But it cannot mean that it's the only mechanism by which that they are constitutionally disqualified. Not present in the text of law. Otherwise, they could just get away with anything. So they say, in summary, based on Section 3's plain language, Supreme Court decisions declaring it neighboring, parallel Reconstruction Amendments, and the absurd results that would flow from their reading, they say Section 3 is self-executing, just automatic, in the sense that it disqualifies provisions attaches without congressional action. Interveners and Trump's arguments do not persuade us otherwise. Now, they say, that said, our conclusion implementing legislation from Congress that implementing is unnecessary does not resolve the question of whether doing so, and so now they're going to turn to justiciability. Like, can you even bring this claim? Can you even say that Trump should be disqualified because it is a political question? They say, no, it's not a political question. A controversy exists here. And here, President Trump claims that the case is not justiciable because in his view, the Constitution and the federal law commit the question of qualifications of a presidential candidate to Congress. Now, they say, we address the issue again. They say we've already provided a thorough review on this. They say, contrary to Trump's assertions, we perceive no constitutional provision that reflects a demonstrable to commitment to Congress of the authority to assess their, their candidate qualifications. And so if Congress doesn't have the right to do it, then the states have the right to do it, right? We've got the federal supremacy clause. And so if, they, if the federal government claims the power, then the states can't do it. But because we perceive no demonstrable commitment to Congress, neither Trump or anybody else can explain why, that, why this cannot go back down to the states for them to figure it out. They say here, this involves stuff that we already know how to work with, manageable standards. They say, oh, this is another good subsection. Does the 14th Amendment apply to the office of the presidency? The Colorado Supreme Court says it does. They say the parties are asking about Section 3. Now, some claim that the source of disqualification encompasses the president. Now, Trump says it does not. And actually, the lower level court, Sarah Wallace, agreed. But Colorado says she was wrong. And they reverse. They say, Section 3 prohibits a person from holding any office, civil or military, under the United States. 
if that person is an officer of the United States and, quote, took an oath to support the Constitution and subsequently then engaged in an insurrection. And so they say, but we have to analyze this. Does Trump fit within that definition? Now, Sarah Wallace at the lower court, that judge, much smarter than these judges, says that the presidency is not an office, civil or military, under the United States for two reasons. She said, well, the presidency is not mentioned in Section 3, but everyone else is. Senators, representatives, presidential electors, they're all listed, but the president is not. And the court found it's unlikely that they would be included in a catch-all of any office, civil or military, which was pretty reasonable. And the court also found that there was an earlier draft of the section that did include the presidency. Uh, it found compelling, but it said, but it, because it was written in the first draft, they got rid of it because they didn't want it to apply in the second draft. Saying the drafters intended to omit the presidency in the new version. It got redlined out. But they say, well, we disagree. We say our reading of the constitutional text says that the presidency is an office under the United States within the meaning of the phrase. They say, very easy. All we need to do is just look at the ordinary meaning of the word, the office, rather than, he said, let's just look to dictionaries from the time of the 14th Amendment. They just went back. They looked up the word office. Office means a particular duty, charge, or trust conferred by public authority or for public purpose that is undertaken by authority from the government or those who administer it. And so they say, well, that seems like an office to me. They say, we don't place the same deference that the same weight on the fact that the presidency is not specifically mentioned. It seems most likely that the presidency, most likely, love that out of your Supreme Court. It seems most likely... <laughs> that the presidency is not specifically included because it is so evidently an office. It's, like it's so obvious that they took it out. In fact, no specific office is listed. Instead, instead, it refers to any office, civil or military. And so they say, yeah, it's true that senators and representatives and other presidential electors are listed, but none of these positions is considered an office under the Constitution. Instead, they're referred to as members. They're not officers either. And so, indeed, even they don't deny that it is an office under the United States. But they say that they are not serving under the United States. And they say, oh, no, we cannot accept that interpretation. A conclusion that the presidency is something other than an office under the United States is fundamentally at odds that all government officials, including the president, serve, quote, we the people. Now, uh, they're, they're referencing the Constitution here at the preamble. But I don't know that that's accurate, right? They say the president is the root power of the executive branch, all right? It's not under anything. That's the separation of powers that we have here. Now, um, it, it is its own power center. That's why it's such an important position. Now, like literally it is above the law. You can pardon people who've been convicted. You can order people to, you know, to go to war. Like you've got, you got the opinion clause power that just gives you the right to have access to certain things, in my opinion. But they say no. A more plausible reading of the phrase under the United States is that the drafters meant simply to distinguish these from the state offices. And so when you start hearing things like most likely, right, this is like, we're just kind of shooting from the hip. We're just kind of duct taping this whole thing together. They say, we think that this is most consistent. The Constitution refers to the presidency as an office 25 times. And the impeachment clause says that disqualification to enjoy any office. Okay, so the office in the impeachment clause is an office. And so we can reference that in the insurrection clause. And if the presidency is not an office, then anyone impeached, including a president, could nonetheless go on to serve as president. So this reading is all nonsensical, and so therefore, we're going to find that it applies to him. They say the district court found it compelling that an earlier draft proposed and the section listed the presidency, but it did not pass. Now, we're mindful that we look back to those things, but by the way, they say we looked at the proposal. And that draft provided that insurrectionist oath breakers could also not hold the offices of the presidency unless they got confirmation of the Senate. And so we read back through that 
and we can't decide what the changes actually meant. Okay, so Judge Wallace was just presuming that they wanted to take the presidency out, but we think that there were a lot of other changes in there, and nothing in the speeches mention why the presidency was removed. We don't know why they took it out, okay? So you can't rely on that one. It's not reliable, and we're just going to read the text. Reconstruction era citizens, post-ratification, and blah, blah, blah. And we conclude that the plain language of Section 3, which says no disqualified person shall hold any office, also includes the presidency. This interpretation is bolstered by the rest of the Constitution. Now, they also decide that he is an officer of the United States. And so very much the same analysis there, no doubt about it. Okay, office, officer, and they're going to find that he did also take an oath. Finally, we consider whether the oath taken by the president is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. They said because the presidential's oath is more particular than that referenced in Section 3, that they did not intend to include former presidents, right? We have a difference between the oaths. And they disagree again. No, it's basically the same. You know, the Constitution provides that all executive and officers shall be bound by oath or affirmation, and they have all got a similar duty to protect the Constitution. Now, they say it's a little bit different. But Article 2 does not include a pledge to support the Constitution. An insurrectionist president, they say, cannot be disqualified from holding office on that basis. But this argument fails. They say the president is an executive officer of the United States, albeit one for whom a more specific oath has been prescribed. Right? So it's, he, he is an, he's an officer, but it's just a little bit more detailed. They say this follows logically from the conclusions. The language of the presidential oath is a little bit different. It's a commitment to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. But that's, that's basically the same thing as support, right? It's basically, it's basically like a long way of saying support. And so we don't even need to break it down, right? They say it's, it, it, it applies. They say President Trump wants us to hold that Section 3 disqualifies every oath-breaking insurrectionist except the most powerful one the highest one in the land, and that's inconsistent, and so we therefore reverse that one as well. Now, they're gonna go back, and, and the rest of these are really about what the lower level court found, and so you can see here, they say, Judge Wallace did not make a mistake in admitting the January 6th report. She's allowed to do that. Liz Cheney worked really hard on that, and so we're allowed to read it. No abuse of discretion. Trump says the report should not have come in, but we said it could come in. They also find what Wallace found. Colorado says Trump engaged in insurrection, saying that he challenges this finding. But the Constitution leaves these terms undefined, and so we've got to make a legal determination about this. Now, this is the second prong, right? And this is actually the prong that the lower level court found was satisfied. So Trump did commit an insurrection, but Wallace said did not apply to him. They are now reconfirming the insurrection finding. They say, an insurrection, to find out what that means, we just look to the dictionary. A rising against civil or political authority. Wow, that's pretty broad. A rising against civil or political authority. I'm pretty sure uh, that just happened in the Capitol building yesterday. Marjorie Taylor Greene posted about that. So I wonder if they're going to go and uh, disqualify everybody who was on that, on, on that party, right? Like, in other words, the, the list is so broad, this could mean anything. Go back to the BLM Summer of Love in 2020. Go back to Kamala Harris's torching of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay, this is a very broad definition if you want to use that. You can see it goes on and on. But they just go back to the dictionary. Webster's, they say, we note at oral arguments that they, Trump's people admitted an insurrection is more than a riot, but less than a rebellion. And we agree, since it's a, it's a spectrum. And so they're just going to define it however they want to here, saying the question is whether the evidence before the court established that there was a concerted and public use of force or threat to hinder the U.S. government from taking actions. And it's undisputed that a large group of people entered the Capitol. Substantial evidence established that the force was concerted and public. The mob was coordinated and demonstrated a unity of purpose, they say. And finally, there's substantial evidence on the record to show that the purpose was to prevent Congress from counting the votes, blah, blah. Now, they say Trump in also engaged in the insurrection. 
because again, they look to the dictionary. Any overt act for the purpose of promoting, we find the definitions are perfect. Substantial evidence shows that even before the November election, Trump was laying the groundwork. Trump was saying, this election was rigged because it was rigged. And by the way, we're saying it's rigged right now. We've been saying it's been rigged for months now. Ever since they indicted him and, and started filing lawsuits to try to remove him from the ballot, this whole thing has been rigged. Joe Biden has wanted Trump to be prosecuted for a long time, made that intimation to Merrick Garland. Jack Smith got appointed and the rest is history. So President Trump, they say, lost the election. No, he didn't. And on this point, the relevant and relevant to Trump's case is that Trump's efforts were subjected to a barrage of harassment and violent threats by his supporters. Trump fanned the flames. Trump was promoting conspiracy theories. With full knowledge of the violent events, he urged supporters to travel. He tweeted. He was posting mean tweets about this. Okay, the court's just going through a hyperventilation. You know, they were probably having a meltdown as they were writing this. All four of them together just circled up. Oh, include that. Include that. Moreover, the record amply demonstrates that President Trump fully intended to and did aid insurrectionists in their endeavors. And so for these reasons, we conclude the record fully supports the court finding that Trump engaged in an insurrection and his speech was not protected. He's not allowed to say that stuff because the First Amendment does not protect incitement. The Brandenburg test, which we've studied all up and down here, and they're going to say that this case law shows that his speech is not protected. When you conduct a true threat analysis, you have to decide what it means. And encouraging the use of violence or lawless action is enough. Here, Trump, President Trump threatened to deploy the military to shoot looters amid protests. Now, the district court also credited the testimony of Professor Peter Simi. And we, as we described, Trump made a bunch of statements about this. The district court brought in a bunch of language. Trump said fight or variations of it 20 times. Wow. He said the word fight or variate. I think he said the word fight like once or twice and variations of it. He says, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. He said, when you catch somebody in a fraud, you're not going to have a country anymore. And all of those statements were so bad that they're not protected under the First Amendment. And they continue on. You see, the court also found that Trump issued and his, his tweets and his conduct were problematic. And they're going back to Professor Simi. So in sum, they say that Trump's speech was not protected by the First Amendment. They say, all right, in conclusion, the district court erred by concluding that the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment does not apply to Trump. We reverse. But as stated above, we affirm much of the reasoning on the other issues. And accordingly, Colorado, one of the most anti-democratic courts in the world, says we conclude that because President Trump is disqualified from holding office, it would be a wrongful act under the election code to list Trump as a candidate on the ballot. Therefore, the secretary may not list President Trump's name on the ballot, nor may she count any write-in votes cast for him. Okay, so a write-in campaign or anything like that, it's all dead. Now, but, but we stay our ruling until January 4th, the day before the deadline to certify the content on the ballot. If review is sought in the Supreme Court before the stay expires, it shall remain in place and the secretary will continue to be required to include Trump's name on the 2024 primary ballot until the receipt of any order or mandate from the Supreme Court. So, that is the ruling. Now you can see this is a big, big butt. That is a big old butt on there because we fully expect Trump to appeal. And that will in enter essentially an indefinite stay. So if Trump can hang on until January 5th and everything is stayed, his name will be on the primary ballot. But is that going to stay up through the general election? Or are they going to try this garbage again? Obviously they will. And so shout out to Chief Justice Boatwright, Justice Samore, and Justice Birkenkotter, who all dissented and did their best to preserve the right to vote for your candidates in America. These other four insane Colorado judges have taken away that right, in theory, 
and we have just a very limited technical limitations that are going to potentially stop that from happening. And so as soon as that happened, we heard from Jenna Griswold, okay? She is the Colorado Secretary of State. She went on MSNBC and started in a very excited manner explaining how this was the right decision. Now, I want you to listen to her language and listen to how much platitudes you hear in her words. This is what she said after the ruling came out. NBC. Look, I believe he incited the insurrection. There were big questions around Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, and the Colorado Supreme Court has weighed in in a very loud way. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment has to apply to the presidency because if not, it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. No, it is not, Jenna. You guys already could have indicted him. You didn't. You already impeached him and you lost, okay? And now you're trying to just take him off the board because you don't like that he's beating you currently. And so this is the guy who is behind the actual litigation. His name is Grimsley, I believe. And Sean Grimsley was working on this case and he is explaining that he thinks they have a chance at the Supreme Court when this lands there, which undoubtedly it will. Here is what that sounded like. You think that you have a chance at the Supreme Court? Uh, we do. I think we have a chance at the Supreme Court. First of all, Trump is going to have to convince the Supreme Court to take uh, this case. And I can imagine a world in which the Supreme Court says, this is pretty early on in the election cycle. Let's see how this plays out in some other states first. So he's first going to have to convince the Supreme Court to take it. And once he convinces the Supreme Court to take it, I, I do think we have a good shot on the substance. Again, we've got good, strong findings of fact from a district court. I think the uh, uh, even the uh, U.S. Supreme Court will respect uh, and defer to those fact findings. And I think on the legal issues, we're very strong. Well, when you're talking about you believe he'll have to convince the Supreme Court to take this, I mean, how long do you envision this this playing out? How long do you think it could be before they do take it up? Well, I suspect he's going to move pretty quickly to seek cert in this case to try and review the Colorado Supreme Court decision that issued today. But it could be that the U.S. Supreme Court says, eh, you know, there are 50 states. This is really the first state that has decided this issue on a full record. Why don't we see what some other states do first there will be more. before they the weigh The domino in. effect is underway. If this does take a long time, I think that's going to be a big question for people. And it makes me think about the arguments that were being made in front of the justices in Colorado, one of them was worried about this potential for, for chaos. Some states letting Trump be on the ballot, some not. Eric Olson, who is one of the other attorneys arguing this, said that any disorder he believed would be figured out pretty quickly was the quote that he used. I mean, that does not seem guaranteed. Are you worried that this could lead to chaos? No, I don't think it will lead to chaos. I think, again, either the court will take it up fairly quickly on this time frame uh, with Trump uh, seeking uh, to appeal this ruling, or you will see another state do something in relatively short order, I would suspect. I'd be a little surprised if this issue weren't settled by the Supreme Court during the presidential primary uh, and certainly before the general election. I think they what do you make do. of what's at the basis of the criticism of this argument, which is that it's unde undemocratic and that it's the voters who should be able to be the ones who yeah. are making this decision? about who's on the ballot and who's not. I mean, Chris Christie is one of the biggest critics. He is trying to take Donald Trump's job as potentially the next president. And he is saying that he thinks this is the wrong ruling. That's the safety valve, right? You, you try to prosecute somebody, you make your opinion, you make your case in the court of public opinion. If Trump's an insurrectionist, nobody's going to vote for him legitimately. But because if, if Trump did something monstrous that was actually monstrous, nobody would vote for him. You have to create this whole story and it's just a story and people can see that that's why people are upset uh well i i respect chris christie's uh view on this but qualifications by definition keep people off ballots and prevent people from voting for who they want to vote for so for instance if obama wanted to run again he could not even though i'm sure there are many people out there who would love to see him serve a third term as president arnold schwarzenegger could not run for president because he is not a natural born citizen. Qualifications, again, by definition, keep people off the ballot. Those are pretty easy to determine, okay? You're either a citizen or not. You either have already won two, can two campaigns or not.
This is a, a finding, right? Determining whether somebody has committed an insurrection that requires a conclusion, that requires some process to come to a determination. It's not just an automatic finding, but they've decided that they could do that in their little election hearing qualification determination proceeding that was like this weird show trial in Sarah Wallace's courtroom. So if that's the standard, then is that, is that the standard that applies everywhere? We can just have our own little, like whatever little cabal of people want to just have a little hearing, they can do that and call that process because it's not the same thing. And Donald Trump is the only person to blame for this. I understand that his supporters may be upset that he could be off the ballot, but he needs to look in the mirror as to what he did on January 6th and the days leading up to it. He is the one and it is his actions that are going to be the thing that keeps him off the ballot. He engaged in insurrection. The framers of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War said, we will not have people holding office who have taken a solemn oath to support the Constitution represent our country again. And he has done that to himself. And if the Supreme Court does take it up and they've got three conservative justices that were appointed to the court by Donald Trump at the center of this, you think that that conservative leaning court is going to hear your argument and agree with you? I do, because, you know, I heard uh, Ellie Honig earlier say that uh, somehow our argument was not an originalist argument. It very much is. If you look at the originalist meaning of the 14th Amendment, it clearly covers the president and the insurrection that he engaged in on January 6th. I think the arguments that we're going to make, the historical based arguments are going to be very appealing uh, to some of the conservative justices there. And I don't think they have any great fealty from a political standpoint uh, to President Trump. Uh, they have a conservative viewpoint of the Constitution, but we think the argument we are making regarding the Constitution is a conservative one. So I think he's partially right. I'm not sure that they do have any loyalty to Trump. I think that they just want to get on the Supreme Court and that's about it. Like that, the, these people are basically you know, groomed their whole life for these positions. So I think that they're much more institutionalist than they are Trumpers. I, I absolutely agree with that. But I'm not so sure that it is an originalist argument, right? They try to make this seem like it is the Civil War. This is not the Civil War. This was four hours. This was a security failure. This was, I think, instigated by the federal government. I think they wanted this to happen so that they could just get rid of Trump and then use this as leverage to stop him from pardoning Assange, pardoning Snowden, releasing the JFK files and so on, right? They needed leverage over him in the last two weeks of the election, and they got it. And that is, I think, the, the, the difference here. One was a multi-year war that resulted in hundreds of thousands dead. This was a four-year hour that resulted in Ashley Babbitt being shot and killed by the D.C. police. So it's a little bit of a different situation. It's not an insurrection, and I don't think that the Supreme Court is going to buy that guy's argument. But it is interesting that they are there and man, they have been successful thus far. I thought that they had been stopped at the lower level district, but lo and behold, you go up to the Supreme Court and the Democrats there found differently. Now, this is Jonathan Turley, another lawyer who's been around a lot longer than I have, but he's got a very similar take. He says, this is the most anti-democratic opinion I've seen in my lifetime. I couldn't agree with him more. And I was almost a little, you know, depressed last night, just to say that, that we got to see another state, just our neighbors right up here in Colorado, take somebody's name off the ballot for over a million people in America. And they just said, well, he's an insurrectionist. Maybe that's true if, you, if you're that whacked out, but don't you want the people to be able to vote that in? If he's so bad, can't people just vote him out? Or you have to literally take the choice away from your neighbor. Okay, that's how sick these people are. And so they're doing it right now. It is a really sad state of affairs. And I think what it shows us is that the semblance of law is just evaporating even faster than we thought. They're willing now to disenfranchise 1.3 million people in order to get their way. Here is Turley. Well, this court just handed partisans on both sides uh, the ultimate tool to try to uh, shortcut elections. And it's very, very dangerous. I mean, this country is a powder keg and this court is just throwing matches at it. And I think that uh, it's a real mistake, but I think that they're wrong on the law. You know, January 6th was many things, most of it not good. In my view, it was not insurrection. It was a riot. That doesn't mean that the people responsible for that day shouldn't be held accountable. 
Uh, but to call this an insurrection for the purposes of disqualification uh, would create a slippery slope for every state in the union. This is a time when we actually need democracy. We need to allow the, the voters to vote. We need to hear their decision. And the court here just said, Too we're not going to get that uh, in Too Colorado. Dangerous. We're not going to let you vote for Donald Trump. No. And, you know, you could dislike yeah. Trump. You could believe he's responsible for January 6th. But this isn't the way to do it. I mean, it is. You know, for the people that say they're trying to protect democracy, this is hands down the most no, anti-democratic please. opinion I've seen in my lifetime. Absolutely true. And I, I challenge anybody to pick a different one. When else has uh, over a million people who are presumably going to show up and vote for Trump, when else have they been denied that right to vote? And the Supreme Court out of Colorado just said, that's the case. And so in America, you know, we're going through some very interesting times, my friends. And so I'm very grateful that we are going through this together. I appreciate you being here as we navigate all of this madness. But Colorado is kicking Trump off the ballot. It's not going to be the first one or the only one. There's a lot of other efforts underway. We've got a lot of runway left on this election season. And so we're going to be here continuing to cover this. I hope that you join us as we do. I'd really appreciate it if you brought a friend or family member over here so that they could come on when we go live and understand what's happening. Grab the inside details from the right perspective so that they can use this knowledge to share with their friends and family because we need more people to realize what's happening here. They're taking away our representation. If you can't go vote for somebody in an election, that is your representative, okay? We have a big problem brewing. And so we're gonna be here co covering my friends. Thanks for joining us as we do. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever it is you're watching and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, now we're not done yet. We're just done with that segment. We're gonna jump in over to another segment as this unfolds. Because we're just getting started here with this removal garbage. California next on deck to kick Trump off their ballot, and they're not alone. Many other states are doing the same thing. We're going to talk about a slew of them and get an update. But California's lieutenant governor, her name is Eleni Kunalakis, she submitted a letter saying it's time for a full-blown investigation. She's got Colorado fever, man, and the only remedy is more Trump removal. And so she launched an investigation that we're going to take a look at. And we're going to get an update on how these dominoes are falling all around the country, or at least how they're setting them up to fall. And now that Colorado has been the first one, we'll see where else it goes. Now, Frank Luntz is also admitting to us that Trump's poll numbers are going to go up. Just as we predicted after the indictments, they're going to make Trump a martyr. They're going to try to take him out. And I don't know about you, but every single time they do something like this, I can become more fortified and more energized, man. And I have a new passion for a new revelation for how confirmed we are that these people are maddening. So Frank Luntz is now saying that, yeah, poll numbers are going to go up. Even John Bolton's like, yeah, it's kind of a bad decision. We'll hear from the Democrats on the left, very excited about it. You can see Shifty Schiff has a little glow in his eye. And then we'll hear from the right, Jim Jordan, Matt Gates, and J.D. Vance all reacting. So what is California doing and what are the other states doing? Well, this is what the letter looks like from this woman, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kaunakalis. And she sent this one out hot on the heels, man. She's still got a glow this morning. She's like, oh man, it's such a great day to be a communist tyrant dictator. Says Elanis Kunalakis, a lieutenant governor on December 20th, wrote the on to the honorable California Secretary of State. Oh, great. Just like the one in Colorado. Says a dear Secretary Weber, coming from the Newsom's number two says, based on the Colorado Supreme Court's ruling in Anderson versus Griswold, I urge you to explore every legal option to remove former President Trump from California's 2024 presidential primary ballot. These people are sick. Just based on this, I'm ex ah! We can get them off the ballot. Text everyone. I am prompted by the Colorado Supreme Court's recent ruling that former President Trump is ineligible to appear on the state's ballot as a presidential candidate due to his role in inciting an insurrection. Now, this decision is about honoring the rule of law in our country and protecting fundamental pillars of our democracy, 
These people are so dumb. They can't, they have nothing else to say other than those things. You're going to protect the pillars of your democracy, moron, by removing, by remove, like in the same sent in the same document, you're going to remove the president and then you're going to protect the fundamental pillars of democracy. They're insane. Like the cognitive dissonance here. Do you understand what the word democracy means? Because it means the people get to vote for things. So it's just crazy. Anyways, so she's demented. I don't know how high she's, I don't know what kind of drugs these people are on or what's going on, but it's out of control. Specifically, the Supreme Court held in Anderson versus Griswold that Trump's insurrection disqualifies him under the 14th Amendment to stand for a presidential reelection. And because the candidate is ineligible, the court ruled, it would be a wrongful act for Colorado to put him on the candidate. Now, thanks for explaining it. We all know. Now, further, the Colorado Supreme Court cites conservative justices like Neil Gorsuch, who said the following. They said, as then Judge Gorsuch recognized in Hassan, in a state's, it's a state's legitimate interest in protecting the integrity and the practical functioning of the political process that permits it to exclude from the ballot candidates who are constitutionally prohibited from assuming office, even though that wasn't on point. But they say, look, California must stand on the right side of history, like little dictator maniacs. And California is obligated to determine if Trump is ineligible for the ballot for the same reasons. The Colorado decision can be the basis for a similar decision here in our state. Exactly right. Domino. Bop, 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 bop. The Constitution is clear. Listen to this moron. Says you must be 40 years old, which is wrong. It's 35, idiot. And not be an insurrectionist. So there will, there will be an inevitable, and she might have corrected this in a, in a more recent update, I'm not sure. But anyways, eh, pretty stupid. Now, there will be the inevitable political punditry about a decision to remove Trump from the ballot. Yeah, because it's anti-democratic, literally. But this is not a matter of political gamesmanship, I'm sure. This is a dire matter that puts at stake the sanctity of our Constitution. She should have capitalized that, that little commie. We cherish the Constitution here and our democracy. Now, time is of the essence. Okay, you have to go fast because Trump is winning. And you have to, your certified list of candidates is coming up in March. The primary election is coming up next week, December 28th, 2023. And so thank you for all your work to make our state's elections a shining example across this country of how dictator-like maniac tyrants act. Thanks for your time and consideration on this urgent matter. People, these, these people are lunatics, man. So this is Ambassador Alini Kunalakis, who can't even recognize that she's asking in the name of preserving democracy in the Constitution, which says you can vote for people, says that we need to remove him in order to preserve our democracy. So they're kind of, you know, psychopaths. But this is just the beginning, my friends. And this is what we were fearing all along, that there was going to be this onslaught, unless the Supreme Court does something about it things might be a bit precarious. We had this over on the X platform, a nice assembly of what's happening by Mario Nafal. He says, here is what's happening. Colorado has already ruled that Trump is ineligible. Okay, that one's done. Maine, we've got a decision expected Friday. California, we just heard from the Lieutenant Governor. New Hampshire, they're considering the 14th Amendment right now. Michigan, there's another lawsuit taking place to bar Trump there over insurrection. And they may soon join other states in making the case. Arizona is currently investigating it. They said we lack authority, but they're going to wait and see. And New Mexico also has a similar thing happening. And that's as of today, okay? Just, they're, they, they've got a victory now. Like, so just wait until all those billionaires start saying, what else can we do about this? So is this going to hurt Trump? I'm not so sure about it, man. Every time they take one of these measures, I think it consolidates his base. I know it incentivizes me. It, it fires me up to come here and defend against this madness. But Frank Luntz is confirming that he thinks the poll numbers are going to go up too. Now, the problem with this is it doesn't really matter what the polls say if he's not on the ballot. You understand that one. And if something happens, like, okay, they kick him off, the Supreme Court says, you know, we're just going to let the states decide, you know, whatever, for some reason. Then we have literally, you know, basically a civil war happening that's taking place vis-a-vis -vis an election. And I have my doubts that they're going to do that, but we saw what they did in 2020. We covered that here at length, my friends. We were watching Ted Cruz and all the attorneys general submit their 
brief to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court just looked the other way. They're not going to get involved. They told us it's a state's issue, right? And so the states dealt with it. They decided there was no rigged elections because all the judges were mirroring the Colorado judges and everything, you know, just left. And now we'll see if anything changes. But here's Frank Luntz saying, you know, poll numbers are going to go up, saying this is probably not good for the Democrats, saying that this is going to turn Trump into a martyr and people are going to react accordingly. And for more on the political impact, we're joined now by pollster and communication strategist Frank Luntz, who has been getting the pulse of Trump voters for years. Let's get this so volume the up. Obvious first question, Frank, what do you think the impact of this ruling will be on their support for him? It's going to be exactly what the indictments did. It's going to be exactly what the criticisms have done. Donald Trump thrives on negativity. He thrives on legal systems that try to hold him accountable. And I'm convinced. You hear his language? This is a language guy. So he thrives on legal systems that try to hold him accountable. What are you talking about, Frank? These are weaponized political attacks by partisan opponents. It's not a legal system. He's very careful with language, okay? You gotta be careful with this guy. He focus groups and tests everything and it's all just, pro like almost every sentence is propaganda, but listen. It's that his polling numbers are going to go up. Just today, the New York Times published six key swing states and had Donald Trump up beyond the margin of error in five out of the six. The polling earlier uh, a month ago was significant. Trump is gaining. The more that he is prosecuted, the more that he is condemned, the higher yeah. his numbers go as people rally around him. Indict him again. And I would say to the judges, as I said to the Justice Department, you're actually making it more likely that Donald Trump is elected next November by how you are pursuing this. You don't explain the decisions. <laughs> yeah, you don't that's right. put things in context. And so Trump climbs and climbs and climbs. And right now he's beating Joe Biden clearly nationwide. Well, I, you know, for the judges would say, look, we're just going by the law without fear of favor. And I mean, but does the context even matter to Trump supporters? Because there have been, I mean, Tonight's ruling was really lengthy, explaining point by point why they believe he incited the insurrection, why the 14th Amendment applies to him. But to the average Trump supporter, that does that context even matter? Is this more about, once again, Trump is the- Can they even read? Do they even know anything that's happening in this country? Do they have two sticks that they can rub together? Uh, we just read the opinion here, lady. The context is that you are trying to remove a citizen from a ballot that hundreds of hundred plus million Americans want to vote for. What other context do you need? The victim of the deep state kind of thinking. It actually proves Trump's point. That's right. It, it does. proves that the people in charge, the people in power Thanks, are Trump. trying to take him down. But it's not, you're not trying to reach all the Trump voters. You're simply trying to reach three or four percent of them that will make a difference in this election. Now, make no mistake, there is very few undecided voters right now. There are very few people going back and forth between Trump and Biden. It's more about those people are trying to decide whether or not to vote. And I got to tell you, Nikki Haley was gaining and gaining and gaining every single day. But she's going to be lost in the coverage for the yeah. next few days, Bye. maybe for the next couple of weeks. As Trump turns this to his advantage, he's taken, he is the best victim politician I have ever seen in my 35 years in doing this. The best victim politician? Are you kidding me? It's because he's been victimized, okay? Everybody is going after everything, Frank. Tishy Latish is trying to take away his business. Miss Bergdorf tried to make up a story about getting Bergdorf. And four indictments in multiple locations. And now they can't even, like, in addition to all of that, right, they can't even play fair. If, if the record is so clear, can we just go vote on this? Yes, and this is exactly what he would have wanted uh, in the run up to the Iowa caucus. Very quickly, because it stuck out to me in looking at these polls, how many people who sat out in 2020 are now saying they're going to vote and they're going to vote for Trump. So you think this just sort of supercharges that, yeah. right? It's going to yes. just bring more people out to vote for him. Who maybe and, the sat out before. Me, and the state that blew me away was Nevada because that's a state with a significant percentage of Latino votes. Trump has been screaming about illegal immigration and Nevada seems to be rewarding him for the language that he uses and for the intensity of his message. If Nevada's going this much for Trump, 
that ought to send you a big signal about what's happening in America today. Ooh, All right, Frank Lons, thank you so much. Up next, the three. Okay, so a lot of people are saying, well, this is because maybe the Democrats want him to win. You know, the Democrats are just trying to, you know, like the, like the other uh, Republican candidates. You know, well, that's because the Democrats really want to run against Trump. That's why they're trying to consolidate support around him. All these attacks are meant to support Trump. And then when Trump wins the nomination, then they'll just steamroll over him. And you say, oh, what, like what? You mean like uh, 2016 when that didn't happen? So. As long as they keep going after Trump, I think that Frank Luntz is actually right. This is a bad decision. It is going to support Trump and that there's going to be more people who say, hey, Trump is right. There's a lot of sense to what he's been saying. It looks like they won't even let us vote for the guy. Maybe they weren't going to vote for him at all. Maybe Colorado is going to be in play now, now that they have been waking up. So this is what John Bolton, who is a rabid anti-Trumper, this is what he said about this, saying, you know, it's not a good take. I think it's completely misplaced. I think this this Colorado Supreme Court decision is badly wrong for multiple reasons. Number one, the the 14th Amendment provides that Congress can pass legislation to carry uh, its provisions into effect, which Congress has done on many aspects. It has not put anything with respect to Section 3 on the books uh, since just after the Civil War. Uh, Second, the the idea that... uh, 50 different state courts can can decide a question involving the highest elective office in the executive branch, interpreting the federal constitution as to what constitutes an insurrection against the federal government uh, is is incoherent. Yeah. And I think uh, undoubtedly the Supreme Court's going to have to clear that up. In terms of what the framers of the 14th Amendment meant, uh, I, I think I think it's quite clear that the radical Republicans in Congress who wanted to suppress the secessionist advocates and governments of the southern states that succeeded would not provide on this critical question of uh, the offices that that are going to be denied to people who broke their oath to the United States, that you're going to put decision making authority on that in the hands of the states, including the former secessionist states that if that was their intention, they were. They were delusional when they did it. So I'd be willing to bet a small amount of money here that the Supreme Court, uh, if it gets to the merits of this, if it has to, uh, will reverse. There's, there's no other logical way you can uh, apply this, and, and it would sow chaos in elections as far as the eye could see. Which is maybe what they want. Maybe they want there to be some other reaction to this so that they can have another J6 effort and say, see, we told you so. There's a more MAGA insurrectionist out there than we thought, right? Or they create a pressure cooker that causes something to happen that they can then capitalize upon. And they, then they say, see, we told you so. Or maybe they instigate it again. Maybe they call up um, uh, Jay Schleps and Jay Schleps, who we know f- related to that other guy, comes out and he does something else again, you know, later down the line. So there's a lot of possibilities here, but man, even a broken clock can be right. This is John Bolton, who is confirming what we all agree that this is, that we all see that this case is poorly decided. Now here's another one. This is Jamie Raskin. He showed up on MSNBC and he's, I think, pretty excited about this ruling. But what I heard from him was a little bit of a reservation on this. And uh, let's listen to it first, and then we'll comment. The ballot, because the Constitution says you have to be 35 years old to run for president. And this disqualification clause says you cannot be on the ballot for president or you cannot serve as president if you have participated in insurrection or rebellion against the United States. And so I would think that regardless of what your politics are, what your party is, Everybody should agree that this is a question of law that's got to be settled by the courts. So this okay. is just a question. So a little bit of a reservation there. It's, we all agree it's a law that needs to be settled by the court. No, we don't agree with that. Okay, this has already been settled. You have your partisan uh, Soros-funded c- civil legal groups who are filing claims in all different locations around the country as part of a lawfare, a coordinated attack to seize power. And it's not. it's not, you know, this is not something that is normal in a free and fair election. They're trying to get their political opponent out of the the board. It's as simple as that. Now, you remember this guy from the illegally constituted January 6th garbage select committees with Liz Cheney and crying Adam Kinzinger. Well, they brought him back on an MSNBC with this woman, and he's going to explain, we're, only, we're not going to listen to the whole thing, just a little bit about their take. He's thrilled, man. What a great day. Uh, Today's decision by the uh, Colorado Supreme Court 
affirm the lower court's decision that the former president had engaged in an insurrection or rebellion, but it reversed the lower court's decision that the 14th Amendment does not apply uh, to presidents, and therefore the former president uh, whose disqualification uh, was at issue. Uh, yeah, we but, got that. Uh, this is not a political decision, oh. uh, Stephanie. It, it, oh, really? It's a, uh, this is a, an opinion of constitutional law. Oh. Uh, it has nothing. So do you see how the, the memes are now creating themselves? So Raskin says, this is just about, this is a legal question. No, there's no politics here at all. What are you talking? Are you kidding me? We're as apolitical as it gets here in the Democratic Party. So that, he's doing the same thing, right? It's just about the Constitution. It's just about the law. This isn't political. It has nothing to do with Trump. To do with politics. And, and uh, I've, I've heard some commentators tonight uh, jump to the conclusion that this is a political decision yeah, it by is. a liberal state Supreme Court. Yes. Uh, there's, it couldn't be anything further from the truth how, how, than that. Explain. The, the opinion by the, the Colorado Supreme Court was a masterful mm. judicial opinion of constitutional law mm. on the applicability of the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, it will uh, stand the test of time, uh, uh, as they say. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think that the Supreme Court of the United States ought to affirm this decision. And based on the objective law in this instance, the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, I believe the U.S. Supreme Court will affirm this. All right. We'll see if they do or not. That's Judge Luddig, one of the slowest talking people on the planet. We've also got this guy's a senator over in the Senate and apparently that video got deleted. So it's not even worth watching. We've got this one from Adam Schiff who posted this one. He says, you know, Donald Trump may not be on the ballot. Listen to how excited this guy was. And we'll listen to about 20 seconds of this. Republican the Colorado Supreme Court is in a case of this kind of significance. It's going to end up in the Supreme Court. What they'll do, uh, you know, there are a lot of constitutional scholars, both left, right, and center who believe that he should be disqualified. It's not so much a question of where you view the Constitution. It is ultimately probably a decision, though, the Supreme Court is going to make about whether they're going to remove that decision from the electorate. But if they... The Supreme Court is going to take it away. Did you hear what he said? The Supreme Court is going to take it away from the electorate, whether he should be qualified. The Supreme Court is going to take it away the Constitution, it is ultimately probably a decision, though, the Supreme Court is going to make about whether they're going to remove that decision from the electorate. But if they rule on the basis of what the language of that amendment says, it's plain meaning he should be disqualified. So big decision in Colorado, not the end of the story, but uh, likely to you know, go to the Supreme Court, uh, but a very big decision tonight in Colorado. He's about as excited as you can see that guy. Look at that smile. He's like, huh, right? He's got that little uh, little sparkle in the eye. So that's Shifty Schiff. And then over on Morning Joe, this woman was saying, if you don't agree with them, if you criticize Colorado, if you dare condemn these liberal lefty Democrat judges, why are you standing with the Confederacy? So in addition to the Adolf memes, now that Trump is Adolf reincarnated, we now have you're all part of the Confederacy as well if you condemn what's happening in Colorado. To the, um, to the Republican candidates argument that this should be, the voters should have the say and not the courts. Why are you standing with Confederates who betrayed this country? <laughs> And this is what they're standing with is the spirit of those Confederates of rather than being, of, of voting the in America? Americans who came together after a long and brutal civil war that was fought what? to keep the union together uh, and saw clearly saw. This is a New York Times member of the editorial board. Her name is Mara Gay. And she's is she related to Claudine? I don't know. They're both writers. Somebody should check her citations. So 
editorial board is now saying that if you want to vote for a candidate in America in 2023, you might as well be Robert E. Lee. Uh, a threat in ex-Confederates running for office, so much so that they amended the Constitution to prevent those traitors from running for office. That should send a message that our election system, our electoral system, can be used for nefarious purposes against the democracy right. itself. It's clear. Uh, it's clear as day. Clear as day. She's pretty upset about it. And somebody should ask her what party the Democrats were when they were, 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 were the Confederates. Were they Democrats? I think that they were. So it's curious. It sounds like her party is the party of the Confederacy, not the Trump people. But by wanting to vote for a candidate, you are now a member of the Confederacy. And apparently you want to return to, I guess, slaveholding times or something. So it's more insanity from those people. Let's see what the Republicans say about this. Jim Jordan was asked about this in follow-up. Of course, Congress might take some action. We've been hearing Congress, you know, might withdraw federal funds or do something. I'm not sure any of that's going to happen in time. But here's what Jordan is talking about when he's asked about what's happening there in Colorado. We expect this to all kick into high gear as the new year uh, turns. Want to ask you about this Colorado Supreme Court decision on President Trump kicking him off the primary ballot. It's clearly in limbo right now, depending on whether or not the Supreme Court takes it up. Do you believe the Supreme Court will take it up? And is it yeah. possible that this could all backfire on Democrats in Colorado by engendering more sympathy yep. and support for President Trump? Well, we'll see. I do. To your first question, I do think the Supreme Court will take it up. I think they'll say this is ridiculous because it is ridiculous. Anyone with common sense can see. Uh, even even Jack Smith, who's been out to get the president, has not charged him with 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 mm -hmm. insurrection, which is what they cited as the reason for keep, keeping him off the ballot. The Fourteenth Amendment doesn't talk about the office of the president in in, in that section of the Fourteenth Amendment. So uh, I think it's and frankly, the president was put on trial and found not guilty by the United States Senate when the Democrats did their second crazy impeachment of him before. Mm -hmm. But the scariest thing of all, in my, in my judgment, John, is the escalation with what the left will do to try to keep Donald yeah. Trump out of the White House. I mean, first it was they spied on his campaign, then it was the Mueller investigation, then it was the impeachment, then it was raiding his home, then it was indicting him in, in four different locations, two Jack Smith at the federal level, two at the state, state level in Atlanta and, and Manhattan, and now they're trying to keep him off the ballot. This from the party who talks about we're protecting democracy. It's ridiculous what they're doing to President Trump, and I think the country sees through it. So to your last question, it may in fact help him in Colorado, but certainly I believe it's going to help him around the country. And is already doing so as evidenced by the poll numbers, which show him winning in every single poll. All right. Well, we've got a lot. It is going to be interesting to see if those numbers hold. I think that they will. And the Democrats are excited, but they may have bitten off more than they can chew. This is what J.D. Vance said about it. He says he's blasting the Colorado decision, says they're trying to use lawfare to take your right to vote away from you. And we're all Colorado now, man, because Colorado will be the first one to go and they're going to try to do this everywhere else. And there's going to be a bunch of Republican candidates waiting in the wings to say, well, Trump's not in, he's not on the ballot in Colorado, and so maybe we shouldn't put him as the lead of the party. He can't even win five states because he's disqualified, so maybe I should be the next nominee. This is J.D. Vance saying this is ridiculous. Kaylee, it's an effort to stop Donald Trump, not at the ballot box, because right now they don't think they can beat Donald Trump at the ballot box, but to use lawfare, to use the legal process as a political weapon to take rights away from American voters. I, I, I will repeat this again and again. This is not just about Donald Trump. This is about millions of American voters who are being told by judges in Colorado, you don't get to vote for the candidate that you would like to vote for. How is that democracy? And how is this in, in any way consistent with the howls of Republicans allegedly being a threat to democracy and then left-wing judges are telling Americans you don't get to vote for the candidate that you want to vote for? It, it's preposterous, Kay Kaylee. Here's another thing, and I, I, just to make a political point, you've had brilliant legal analysts. 
The question, I think, for Republican voters is, do we let left-wing radicals choose our nominee? They are staring us in the face saying, we dare you to select Donald Trump as your nominee. I think we take that bet and we go with the guy who's showing that he's not controlled opposition. If we are letting these people select our nominee for us, what good are we as a party? There are some great people running, but this is now, to me, an assault not just on one man, but on the Republican Party's ability to select its nominee for the general election. Absolutely. That's why it's such a big deal, because it is so broad. It's not even just about Donald Trump per se. I mean, Trump is running, of course, but it's 1.3 million people in Colorado who I I guess, I guess they got to go vote for Nikki Haley now, right? That's insane, right? It's not only about the Democrats beating Trump. It's also about the Republican establishment beating Trump. If Trump's not on the primary ballot, who benefits from that? Nikki Haley does. Ron DeSantis does. And so they're just, you know, and allow it to go forward. And so enough of that crap, right? They're trying to take it away from the entire party. J.D. Vance is dead right about that. So shout out to J.D. And Matt Gates is here reacting as well, calling this what it is. He says that Democrats are trying to go after their chief political opponent. He says, I'm confident that the Supreme Court will not allow this ruling to stand. The American people are going to decide our president, not the courts. We are the winning team, and that's why the left is acting out so crazily. They have no arguments left to make. Who wants to vote for high crime, high taxes, high prices, and low testosterone? Endless wars. It's not really a winning agenda. But they have to smear us as extremists, try to imprison us, commit election interference and election fraud against us to protect their power. They're literally working to knock Donald Trump off the ballot in the name of protecting democracy. Removing the leading candidate in a national election from the ballot is the most dictatorial thing the Biden administration and their allies could ever even think of. And they're doing it, and they're celebrating it. Shifty Schiff and others. They're trying to beat Trump in the witness box and the jury box because they know they can never legitimately beat him at the ballot box. Absolutely right, because they're cheaters, they're bullies, and they're censors, and they don't want to play fair. And so that, my friends, is what is happening. California is next. We've got other states that are considering the same thing. And of course, we're going to be here continuing to cover this. And so thanks for checking us out. Thanks for subscribing wherever it is you're watching this and inviting a friend or family member over to come check out the show. We also have a new website up at robertgovea.com. Our shop is live. And so you can grab the latest watcher hat. It's right here. They're great quality. This is my daily driver. And as we watch all of his disgusting behavior around the world, it's important that we remember the symbolism and the values that we hold dear. And so we explain what the symbol of the watcher is and what it stands for, including slicing through the veils of ignorance with the sword, talking about the unbalanced scales of justice, talking about the shield. It's a great hat. It's a great way to support the show. We very much appreciate you checking out robertgovea.com slash shop. We're going to be here continuing to cover all of this Trump madness and more. And we're looking forward to seeing you as we do. Thank you for subscribing. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right. And now, my friends, we got one final segment on the day before we jump into your questions and your comments. And let's get right to it. President Biden comes out and makes some comments about Donald Trump and the so-called insurrection. And he probably shouldn't have done that. Remember, he's supposed to be disconnected from this whole thing because he runs the DOJ, which is currently prosecuting his political opponent in two different courts. So Trump has also now been removed from the ballot in Colorado pending the appeal. And Biden was asked about this in what appeared to be a very scripted answer question exchange. He walks out of this car and they say, "Uh, dear Mr. President, is Trump an insurrectionist, sir? And he's going to say this exactly. It's self-evident. You saw it all. Okay, not I can beat Trump at the ballot box. Not let's let the process of law unfold. Not let's see what the court, the Supreme Court says about any of this. He says, no, I'm the chief law enforcement officer of this country. I'm the executive. I've ordered Trump to be prosecuted via Merrick Garland, passing it off to Jack Smith. 
And now he's saying the same thing, right? It's all done. You don't even need to think about it. This is the mens rea that they're always talking about with Trump, right? They always say Trump is intending to do this or he's intending to be corrupt and whatever. This is Joe communicating it to us. He's not neutral and disconnected. He wants him prosecuted. He wants him removed from the ballot. And this is what it sounds like now. He walks right over to this reporter, feels very scripted. Let's watch. Is Trump an insurrectionist, sir? Well, I think it's certainly self-evident. You saw it all. Now, whether the 14th Amendment applies, I'll let the court make that decision. But he certainly supported an insurrection. So that little caveat. Well, whether it's the 14th Amendment applies, we'll give it to, you know, let the court decide. But he certainly is an insurrectionist. And no question about it. None. Zero. None. Zero. And, uh... He seems to be doubling down on about everything. Anyway, I've got to go do this. Doesn't want to an answer any other questions about that. Now, listen to this exchange unrelated to Trump. This guy over here asks him about a hostage deal. Listen to Joe. Watch. I've got to go do this. Hey, what is, do, are we expecting a hostage deal anytime soon? Yes. Oh, really? Oh, really? Well, where, where? Oh, no. Oh, no. I was, I was talking about... Over You're talking about the... We're pushing it. We, I, I don't, there's no expectation at this point, but we are pushing. Can you address the prisoner exchange with Venezuela, sir? No. Yeah, I, can I do that after no, this No, he event? can't. Okay. All right. But it lo looks good. It looks like Maduro so far is keeping his commitment on a free election. It ain't done yet. Got a long way to go, but, uh, but it's good so far. And your reaction to 20,000 dead in Gaza, that death toll reached today? This Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so that's our president. Can't answer much, but he is certainly keen on Donald Trump being an insurrectionist. It's self-evident. My DOJ is already prosecuting him. I'm the president. I think he's an insurrectionist. And so that's, that's now public policy in America. Okay, Joe Biden is supporting the prosecution of his political enemy openly, verbally, and saying it's not even without question. So Vivek came out as one of the 2024 candidates responding to this. We'll see what Ron says. We'll see what Nikki Haley said about it. Then we'll jump over to some reaction from the House and from the Colorado GOP before Texas says maybe Joe is the next person who should be thrown off the ballot. But this was Vivek. He came out of the 2024 candidates, one of the first ones out of the gate, and said this is absolutely outrageous. Getting 14.2 million views. This is a big one. Is really caught. He said, you know, if Colorado's going to do this, I pledge to withdraw from the Colorado primary until Trump is allowed back on the ballot. And I demand that Ron and Christie and Haley all do the same thing or else they are tacitly endorsing this illegal maneuver, which will have disastrous consequences for our country. In other words, the vague will be protesting and boycotting the primaries. They have just tried to bar President Trump from the Colorado ballot using an unconstitutional maneuver that is a bastardization of the 14th Amendment to our U.S. Constitution. This was a provision, Section 3, that was designed to bar Confederate members, people who switched to the Confederacy, from actually being able to serve. That's very different than what's at issue here, to say the least. This is a hollowed out husk of what the country was built on. The basic principle that we the people select our leadership, not the unelected elite class in the back of palace halls. That's old world Europe, not the United States. That's why I'm making a pledge today that I will withdraw. I pledge to withdraw from the Colorado GOP primary ballot unless and until Tr Trump's name is restored. And I demand that Ron DeSantis and Chris Christie and Nikki Haley do the same thing. Why would they do that? Or else these Republicans are simply complicit in this unconstitutional attack That's their whole on the plan. way we conduct our constitutional republic. That's the strategy. I refuse to be complicit in that. I think what they're doing is wrong. And I think it's up to Republicans to step up and stand up with a spine for our country's future. That's really what's at stake. Whether we the people actually have a say in deciding who leads this country. Yes, it would be easier for other Republicans like me who are running in this race to say, hey, if Trump is sidelined, there's our opportunity. Yeah, I'm no two. doubt other candidates are probably privately celebrating yeah. with their corporate sponsors. That's not the right thing to do. I think the most useful thing that every GOP candidate can do right now is to join me in that pledge. I'll say that I will withdraw from that Colorado GOP primary ballot until Trump's name is restored. This belongs to the people, not to the unelected Democratic cabal of judges in Colorado or any other state. 
And I demand that Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley and Chris Christie do the same thing or else they're complicit in what the security state is trying to do to shut down Trump. I stand by that and I expect them to do the right thing. Well done there, Vivek. I absolutely love that because it feels accurate, right? And we've got Nikki Haley, who's in number two. And if Trump's off the ticket, guess who slots into number one? So why would they want to do that same maneuver? They're more interested in their own personal gain than they are by having the Democrats try to weaponize the electoral system against the entire country for their own continued power. Now, Ron finally posted something about this. He was getting skewered about this last night on the platform. People were, where's Ron at? Why didn't he respond so quickly? And then he finally responded. And he posted this after the story broke at 7.22 p.m., December 19th. And he was retweeting some weird banana thing. And Mike Lee said, you know, this is a wake up call. Base Mike Lee, who's a senator for Utah, he said in some banana thing, he said, this is not just another bad politically motivated ruling. This is lawless thuggery masquerading as jurisprudence, basically saying that we're living in a banana republic. And Ron retweeted this. And, you know, the primary in many instances is happening on X, which is the only thing that counts right now because who cares what they say on CNN? But Ron says the left invokes, quote, democracy to justify its use of power, even if it means abusing judicial power to remove a candidate from the ballot based on spurious legal grounds. SCOTUS should reverse. All right, thanks, Ron, for your very um, aggressive statement there. It's like a sentence. Not much to it. SCOTUS should reverse. And then let's see if he said anything else about it a little bit more recently. Border Patrol conservative club. And that's it. Now he did say something else about this recently. And I think this was today. He said, DeSantis, he says, you know, there was no trial. He did come out and give a much bigger statement. Here was, here's what Ron said. He said, here's the thing, the left and the media, they're, they're doing all this stuff to basically solidify support in the primary. Okay. Do you think this is what's happening? that they're gonna put Trump on top and then boot him off at the end? This is Ron, if this video will load. Let's see if X will work with us here. It's not, I'll read it. Ron says, okay, there was no trial on any of this. They basically just said, you can't be on the ballot. I think the Supreme Court's gonna reverse that. But here's the larger thing of what the left and the media and the Democrats are doing. They're doing all this stuff to basically solidify the support in the primary for Trump get him to the general and the whole general is going to be all this legal stuff, right? Once we get there, look, it's unfair. They're abusing power 100%. But the question is, is that going to work? So I guess you, you just get rid of the person they're doing it to so that you don't have to deal with the issue. I think that they have a playbook that will unfortunately work. And so we shouldn't like fight back against that and support Trump. We should just vote for me. It'll give Biden the ability to skate through this thing. That's their plan. That's what they want. What they don't want is to have somebody like me who's going to make the election about the failures of Biden, the failures of the left, and how what we're going to be doing to turn the country around. It's like how the election is framed. We will win. He says, they're doing this for a reason. Do we want to have 2024 be about this trial, uh, that this case, to have to put hundreds of millions of dollars into legal stuff? Or do we want this to be about your issues, about the country's future with a nominee that's going to be able to prosecute that case against the left? So it's basically saying, look, like, let's just forget about what they're doing to Trump. Okay, so let, we, we, can't, we can't get behind him because what they're doing is working. So let's just give up and give in to this new playbook so that whenever they do it, they can just lop off the top candidate, right? And then you just have to go back to the second person. So they're trying to rally around Trump and they're, it's going to work. So don't pick him. Instead, pick me. It's wild, right? Because Ron, you know, they're going to do that to you, buddy. Like you'll be next. Do you think the Democrats give a crap? I remember growing up when George Bush was the man, right? And they, George Bush, war for oil, all the things. I mean, they hated that guy. Donald Trump is like that times 10. And it just keeps escalating, right? So Ron, like the next person, it's, it's not going to stop with Trump, obviously. And, and this is one of the biggest issues in the country. If you have no law, if you can't vote and, and actually participate in your country and selecting your leaders, what the hell good is anything else that we talk about?
What issues, Ron? You think we're caring about inflation if we can't even pick our elected officials? They just pick themselves. So what good is, inf- is, is, is caring about inflation or these other issues if there is no rule of law, if we can't even have self-governance in this country? So I understand why he's saying these things. He has to say these things, but it is a far fall from the truth. This is the, one of the biggest issues in the country, if not the biggest issue. It is the seizure of our representation away from us. There is no country if you don't have representation. That's how our country has been formulated. So it's a sad showing from that campaign, but what can you do? Now, Nikki Haley, the last I checked, has largely ignored this on the X platform. And again, I don't know if she's talking about this elsewhere, but this was the first post after the ruling drop at 7.50 last night. And she's not obligated to defend Trump. Nobody is, right? Ron DeSantis is not obligated to defend him. That's fine if he doesn't want to do that. If he wants to come out and say, well, they've got a pretty good uh, bat, you know, beating against Trump and I don't want to defend him. That's fine. He's free to do that. But we're free to make judgments on the candidate for not standing by a key issue in the country. We're also free to, to comment. So here, Nikki Haley, she just posted about Iowa. She says, Iowa, they remind me a lot of South Carolina. They're strong, tough, blah, blah, blah. Iowa, let's move forward and leave the drama and the chaos in the past. So you get that? That's her response to Trump being removed. Let's leave the drama, which is just anti-democratic dictatorial nonsense, and let's leave the chaos in the past. So not talking about it. Nikki Haley also says this, uh, says right now in America, our borders are a problem. Talking about an endorsement, felt the energy in Burlington, going out to caucus in Christmas season. Uh, in case you missed it eight hours ago, she got another endorsement. Nothing hasn't even commented on it at all on X out in Burlington talking about president. She, okay. It's not even an issue to her. So having people remove from the ballot, not even worth a, a, a X post, which is just incredible. Now, I also checked her other account, which is Team Nikki Haley. Did they post anything about this today? Uh, no, same stuff here. She got new endorsements. So they're not even gonna talk about it on the X platform. We've got momentum in Iowa. We're second place in Iowa, second place in New Hampshire, second place in South Carolina. Why wouldn't she want to defend Trump? Because if Trump's off the ballot, then she's first place. See how that works? So these people are just in it for themselves. They don't care about democracy at all. Now, Donald Trump's campaign issued a statement on this, and they said, you know, unsurprisingly, the all-Democrat appointed Colorado Supreme Court ruled against Trump, supporting a Soros-funded left-wing group and election interference. The leaders in Democratic parties are in a state of paranoia. Trump has a dominant lead, massive leads in the polls. Now, they've lost faith in the Biden presidency, now doing everything they can to stop him. But we have full confidence that the U.S. Supreme Court will quickly rule in our favor and finally put an end to these un-American lawsuits. Now, something interesting that came out from the Colorado GOP as well. They said, hey, to Vivek, you're not going to have to withdraw from this primary, okay? Because if they boot Trump off the ballot, we're going to convert this to a pure caucus system if that, if this is allowed to stand. And I don't know if there is any truth to that or any oomph behind that request, but it is certainly interesting that the Republicans are theorizing about alternative plans. Speaker Johnson and the U.S. House of Representatives also came out and explained that today's ruling that is attempting to disqualify President Trump from the ballot is nothing but a thinly veiled partisan attack, saying regardless of political affiliation, every citizen registered to vote should not be denied the right to support the person they want. We trust the Supreme Court is going to set aside this reckless decision and let the people of America decide who is the next president of the United States. Now, Donald Trump was also upset about this on True Social. Didn't post much, but said, this is a sad day in America. Says Biden should drop all of these fake political indictments against me, both criminal and civil. Every case I'm fighting is the work of the DOJ and the White House. No such thing has ever happened in our country before, calling it a banana republic and election interference and saying this is a shame for our country. And he's right about that. Now, are the Republicans going to respond in kind? 
Is anything going to happen in response? We don't know. But here was a Texas lieutenant governor who is responding, saying, you know, maybe we should just take Joe Biden off the ballot, right? If he is the person responsible for a literal invasion at our southern border where there's tens of thousands of people coming across every week, if not every day, then that feels like a dereliction of duty. That feels like an insurrection. We know that you don't need to have a congressional finding. We know that you don't need to have a criminal indictment. All you need to have is a little stupid hearing in some courtroom and then a bunch of judges to sign off on it. So why don't they do that in Texas? Why don't they just throw Joe Biden off the ballot and we can just get to the civil war right now? To deport them. Joining me now is a Texas Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick. Uh, Dan, now the White House said today that this law won't make communities safer. <laughs> Your response. So we spent a lot of time, Laura, in the Senate writing this bill along with the governor, and we believe we have a bill that will uh, survive any type of Supreme Court challenge because we are being invaded. Uh, Arizona tried this about 10 years ago, but our law is different. It simply says that our law enforcement can arrest anyone, uh, take them in, uh, do a background check, photograph, do fingerprints. Uh, if they saw them cross the border illegally, uh, we can do that. Or if they happen to reveal in the arrest stop that they uh, crossed illegally, and then the magistrate will send them back and will escort them to the border. Uh, and they have a choice. They can go to jail or they can go back. And if they go back and try to come back again and we arrest them again, the penalty gets even higher. We're fed up. In fact, seeing what happened in Colorado tonight, Laura, it makes me think, except we believe in democracy in Texas, maybe we should take Joe Biden off the ballot in Texas yeah. for allowing 8 million people to cross the border since he's been president, uh, disrupting our state far more than anything anyone else has done in recent history. And so um, this, is, uh, this is so outrageous, 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 people a day crossing the border, 8 million now, people the numbers, since he's been in yeah. office, enough to be the 12th largest state, yeah. it's incredible. Tons of people, 8 million by his numbers. It is maddening what's happening there, right? It is uh, a travesty at the border, not only for our country, but for the people that are being incentivized to come across there, thanks to Joe Biden and Kamala, the border czar, and saying, you know, if 8 million people come across and invade your country, invade your state and wreck your sovereignty, maybe that's an insurrection, much more than a four hour riot was with $2 million of damages. That's basically nothing relative to what we have everywhere else, billions and billions of dollar in a full land mass invasion from the Southern border. I think that maybe that's appropriate. And if they're gonna remove him and Trump's gonna get removed, then maybe it's just gonna be political battles like this for the foreseeable future and the country will just continue to deteriorate. But let's not forget the Democrats are the ones starting this. Joe Biden is orchestrating the whole thing probably propped up by Obama and others to say Trump's an insurrectionist. Everything needs to be weaponized to stop him. And they're pulling out all the stops. And so we'll be here continuing to cover this, my friends. Thank you for joining us as we do. Thanks for checking out our new website, robertgodvea.com. We've got our brand new shop that's available there. Our demented president can be memorialized with the flip flipping Joe Biden sandals. We got crackhead hunter, tucked away in there. You can see there's Hunty smiling away at you there on the sandals. There's Hunter tucked away up there in the sandals. And so you can get these. Nothing is going to make your feet feel so good as having them rest on the faces of our leaders. And you can use these to take the trash out. You can use these when you're picking up your dog do or whatever you need to do. RobertGovea.com slash shop to get the flip flop and Joe Biden sandals. They're good quality and it's a great way to support the show and to have a little bit of fun. And so thanks for checking those out on the shop. Now we're gonna be here continuing to cover Joe and our other demented leaders. And we'll look forward to seeing you join us here. Thank you for subscribing wherever you're watching this. Thanks for inviting a friend or family member to come and join us. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you right back here on the next one. All right, and a great comment. Uh, LJC on YouTube says, I'm not real sure I want Joe Biden sniffing my feet. And that's a good comment, yeah. But it's... It's better than sniffing, uh, you know, an eight-year-old's hair or something like that, which is what he really prefers. But Ray K, new members. Okay, my friends. So thank you for joining us on the day. We covered some good ground. The Biden insurrection comments. We've got California going to be moving Joe 
moving Trump off next if they can get to it. Frank Luntz admitting that the poll numbers for Trump are going to go up. And of course, we covered the full Colorado Supreme Court removal filing the order from the Supreme Court out of Colorado. And it is a shocking and historic day that they are disenfranchising an entire state. But now, my friends, it's time to hear from you. We are going to go over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for the members only after party. We'd love to see you there. We really try to deliver for our members. We do Saturday streams. We do morning streams. We already did a full stream this morning before this show started. So come check us out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And now let's see who is joining us on this beautiful, beautiful day. And thank you, Vientikiss, for clipping away for us. Starting us off with B-Man. B-Man's here. He says... Anyway, Trump has court on January 6, 2024 in Barrel's courtroom over somebody suing President Trump over a pyramid scheme. How do you think it's going to go? Uh, I don't know, actually. I don't know what that one is about, B-Man. I think you brought that up yesterday. Do you have a case name or something like that? I'm not sure what it is. Is, is It's a civil lawsuit, so it's probably something um, Trump University related or something like that. It's probably important, but probably less important than the other cases we're covering. But if it's out of New York, if it's out of or Washington, D.C., and it's Judge Beryl, it's not going to go well. Judge Beryl Howell from Washington, D.C., it's not going to go well. B-Man says, I have a law school dean that I talked to at work, and he basically said Colorado can't remove a federal candidate. Only the Supreme Court in D.C. can. That's one interpretation. The Colorado Supreme Court certainly thinks to think that they can do it. They're going to wait until the Supreme Court chimes in, but Colorado says they can do it. Kath, and shout out to your uh, law school dean guy. Catherine Rex says, Rob and Mods, happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday to you, Catherine. Thank you for being here. Hey, what's up, Daniel Henry? Good to see you, Daniel. Says, getting removed from the ballot by the Democrats didn't stop Lincoln. Hopefully, it won't stop Trump. Yeah, I think that's true, right? And the the, the Lincoln-Trump comparisons are little interesting, aren't they, Daniel? Yeah. They did a lot that they could to remove Lincoln. And when that didn't stop Lincoln, something else happened. So we're not hopeful for that at all, Daniel. But my goodness, talk about a comparison. Glocky McGlockface is here, says, you know, Rob, I was once willing to go and fight for my country and my family. And now I'm willing to fight and die to protect my family from what the country has become. Well, I don't think you're alone in that, Glocky McGlockface. A lot of people are not joining the military anymore. A lot of military families are not continuing the tradition, is what it appears to be, because they are down in polling or down in uh, recruitment numbers are all across the board. It says you're witnessing in real time how the Nazis were able to get other people, like Jews and Gypsies and Poles, on trains because just like conservatives, they also didn't fight back until it was too late. Welcome to 1935 Germany. That's a spicy comment, Glocky McGlockface. You know, and, and, and there's, you know, some parallels in terms of, you know, obviously it's a, it's a different, we don't have, uh, you know, concentration camps and things like that yet, but it's certainly the, the frog in the boiling pot analogy, right? Things go slow and it's like, Hey, you know, I didn't speak out for the Poles cause I wasn't a pole. I didn't speak out for the gypsies because I wasn't a gypsy. I didn't speak out for the Jews cause I wasn't a Jew. And then when they came for me, there was nobody to speak out for me right? Which is why I said we're all Coloradans today. B-Man says he wasn't impeached. January 25th was after he left office and impeachment is only for a sitting president. And also chief justice wasn't there. So it was phony and unconstitutional. Another interesting take from B-Man. Well, then that would, um, that would defeat my double jeopardy argument, right? Like if that was all fake and rigged and there wouldn't be double jeopardy and then and so there'd have to be, I still think that there should be a congressional finding. It doesn't negate that, but it's an interesting take, B-Man. Good to see you. Vienti Kiss says, well, you know, everyone who wants to cry and moan about spoiler votes, votes, this is just the next step. Your vote is your voice made manifest. Don't let someone compel your speech. If you want to vote for a ham sandwich, vote for a ham sandwich. Of course, I always find that argument interesting for other reasons as well. I mean, you weren't going to vote for either way, but now that you did vote without voting for any of the favored is somehow wrong. People need to spend more time listening to themselves talk. Also, when we were talking the other day about chats not being read, this is an example. It, it's not showing up in the chat 
but locals took the money. <gasps> I didn't know that V and V you would know because you clip a lot for us. So thank you for that. That's interesting. I'll have to figure out what that's all about. B.H. Williams says, that's one interpretation. Section 5 says Congress can enforce the 14th Amendment through appropriate legislation. They passed 18 U.S. Code 2383, but no one's been charged under that for January 6. B. Torn says, it's all toss spaghetti at the wall and see if it will stick. Attempts at setting a new precedent. Guilty, because we say so, because Trump. And I think that's absolutely true which is why all the civil lawsuits are going on four different indictments all dropped right around the same time. Like they all didn't investigate independently and then drop them back to back. That was all done, you know, coordinated. And it's the same thing happening now with removal. They're filing in, in all the same States. It's the same people behind all of them. B torn says all this BS says these judges are activists in robes by choice not constitutionalists bound by their oath to it. No, they're, they're partisan activists who want to create an outcome and they're driving towards it. And like I said, I like to know about the politics of, of this. Like I know who is on our Supreme Court and I know how they got there. And I don't know the same thing about, like I know the inside baseball about how at least the most recent addition to our Supreme Court got there. Like I get it. And it's gross. So who are these people and how did they get onto the Supreme Court bench? Because it's very, very political, much more so than I would say at the Supreme Court level. The Supreme Court level at least has national scrutiny to it. And so everybody's watching and paying attention. So it's hard to be a little bit more political. But at the lower le at the state level Supreme Courts, I think that they are in many cases, you know, appointed by the governor and there's a lot less scrutiny on those people. So yeah, I got a lot of questions about who these judges are. Vienticus says, you know, for laughs, I'd like to see them brave turning down my write-in votes. Let's see how hard they want to stick to the whole idea of, oh, you can vote, but you can only vote for who we tell you. A class action would be the lightest thing that they could ask for in that case. Yeah, not, not even a write-in. Like, you don't get to vote for him, period. Thanks. And CF Rob said California is going to remove Trump in response to the, the ruling in Colorado. Rob, you read our mind. We got to that story. V says, I know that there are some that would like to think such a thing would lead to civil war, but it's not. If there was such a thing that would happen, it would be an uprising in all the blue states. The red states aren't going to get involved. They wouldn't need to. They just watch the natural progression of events. Rob says, Joe Biden is committing an insurrection by allowing illegals to take over the country. I think that's a good point. Lieutenant Governor might be wanting to do something about that. Knox Bierman, attorney in Texas, says, remember when the argument was strict constitutionalism versus an activist court? Yeah, it was a lot simpler back then. No one could really tell the difference when listening to argument in con law. Yeah, I mean, Knox, I, 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 you know, talking to other lawyers, it's like the whole, the whole legal system is, is in, I, I, what are they teaching in law school now? Like, is it different than, than? I don't know. Anyways, the whole, the whole system is changing rapidly right in front of us. Knox says, forget to, forgot to say happy Wednesday, all happy Wednesday. Knox it says the elite think we are just so dang nose picking stupid that they need to remove our candidates for our own good. Just like quarantine. Yeah. Quarantine laws. You're too stupid to save yourself. And if you think exercise is good for you, you're wrong. You don't get to go outside, sit at home, lock yourself down with your neighbors or with your family, so you can all just sit and, and, and hang with each other. Okay, here, this one's interesting. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. So Cernovich retweeted this. Said, this one is from Gaspacho Policewoman. Says, okay, so Ted Lou is responding to this, and Cernovich tweeted this. He says, if SCOTUS does indeed rule that the president has absolute immunity and can engage in insurrection, oh my gosh, then President Biden has carte blanche to do whatever he wants, including refusing to leave office at the end of his term. What on earth? This is a congressperson called Ted Lieu saying correct. That is interesting. First of all, Ted Lieu's a moron because that's not at all what Trump is asking about. Trump is asking about absolute immunity for actions that are within his oath of office. 
right, within the, the duties of the presidency, like challenging rigged elections. So it would be that he did not engage in an insurrection, right, or that there is no insurrection. So President Biden cannot just not leave the office because that would be outside of the scope of the presidency, right? Like that's clearly illegal. What Trump was doing was not clearly illegal or illegal at all. He was saying the word fight, which is protected under the First Amendment, like every other Democrat has said. He was challenging a rigged election, which he's allowed to do, which we were asking him to do. And there was no insurrection. It was all made up hoax by the government. Saying that a protest and a riot was somehow a seizure of power, even though it was done and they voted it back in in four hours. So one is not like the other, but Ted Lieu is not that intelligent. And so he has a hard time disambiguating the two. What's up? We got the blind lawyer says, sent your video to another lawyer. Well, thank you for doing that. The blind lawyer explains over on Rumble as a member on Rumble and has a channel over there that you should check out. Sent your video to another lawyer. Hopefully they enjoy it. Knox says, if someone has to use a catchphrase or a meme to press their point, I immediately assume they didn't get very far in logic class and says, by the way, I'm a freaking Mensa member, which means you're super smart, high IQ, board certified criminal defense attorney, which is a lot of work, admitted into six federal courts, in, including SCOTUS, me too on that one, but these talking heads are so insulting to people on the regular. Uh, definitely not board certified. I didn't practice for long enough. I think it's, well, I mean, I'm still licensed, but you know, I think it's like, I did practice long enough technically, but I don't think I practiced. Being a board certified criminal defense attorney is a cool thing, by the way. That's a real nice accomplishment. Like you got to do a bunch of stuff in order to get it. Like it's a checklist, a bunch of stuff, and I never did it. So very cool. So you're highly credentialed, highly qualified, but unfortunately, Knox, you might vote for Trump. So that means you're a moron. All right, we've got, unfortunately, so am I. We've got Ray Ronk says, I was taught that the state can't legislate federal law. Well, my friend, but you've also probably learned about you know, America not prosecuting their political enemies, right? You, I, I was taught that too. Like we don't do that in this country. <laughs> not anymore though, man. We, have, we gotta go back to school. Knox says, slaves, I can't even get an intern. They don't wanna work, man. Yeah, it's tough to get good, good interns out there. We, had a, we developed a pretty good internship program with our local university, Knox. You might wanna try that out. Uh, many universities have, you know, like programs for it. And we, we had a real nice system where we would just go there every semester and inter like just do a bunch of interviews there on campus and just, you know, drag the law school students out and often they'll get class credit for it. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you know all that, but that's how we did it. Anyways, GDL says they are ecstatic about this. Watermelon head is so excited. What a loser. They're mocking themselves and makes, hopefully it makes them sleep at night. Uh, they seemed very excited about it. We had uh, Shifty was just like on a, on a high. GDL says this batch of Democrats can't even handle who they have become. That's a prescient comment. You know, I think that there will be repercussions for this some at some point down the line. And it's like, you guys remember that you have to live in the same country that we do. So if you're going to just start doing this stuff, like you're gonna have to live here in the aftermath of all this wreckage that you cause. The Antica says, this has been the USSA for decades. Certainly feels like that. Definitely accelerated after 2020 and the pandemic. Mark Butcher, what's up, Mark B? Says, love your show, Rob. Thank you, Mark. Man, I love you being a member of our locals community and thanks for the lovely dono. Rob is here, says, anyone with money can go to other states to remove Biden from the ballot in multiple states, forever insurrection against the federal government with the illegal alien invasion. Chances this will also go after Thomas, was also to go after Thomas and Alito? You mean like trying to bait them so that they can see if they can get them recused on this for some reason? Um, I don't know that I'd go that far yet. I don't know that I've seen anything. That, what, what, what would cause Alito or Thomas to recuse themselves from this case? or from any of these cases. Is there anything? I can't think of anything. GDL says taking bribes is more evident and is more evidence and more evident of maybe insurrection 
or uh, definitely impeachment is something we're talking about. We got B man says Biden said he was guilty when he and he's the judge getting off the plane. That's exactly right, B man. He should not be talking like that because he controls the DOJ, which is the entity that is prosecuting Trump. He should say, Joe Biden should say, you know, I don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do. I don't have any comment on it, okay? I trust the system to handle this. I'm ready to beat Trump anyway. And I want Trump on the ballot because we're going to mop the floor with him. That's how confident I am. So I don't think he should be removed, but it's not my call. It's the, it's the people of Colorado. It's the Supreme Court, and I'm going to defer to them. But no. He can't do that because he's a partisan hack who wants his political enemy removed. And he's dictating that now to the entire Department of Justice. Okay, just reverse that. What if Trump came out and said something even remotely similar, you know, about anybody? They would have a meltdown. He's using the power of the presidency, the bully pulpit to go after everybody. Yeah, and that's why it's inappropriate. Ray K is here bringing in new members. What's up, Ray K? Bringing in Karen O, Holy F, Mari's here, Marlene S, and LJC number eight in the house. Gifted members, courtesy of Ray K here, being a membo and bringing in five new members as well. And uh, of course, if you're a YouTube member, don't forget to grab the Telegram link, which is where we have our members only after party after the show. You can navigate over on the YouTube channel homepage, go over to the community tab section, scroll down, get the Telegram link, and we'll see you there. We've got this one came in from Brandon Lesko. Brandon says, Rob, did you go over whether or not the COSC did a wee bit too much fact finding instead of legal review. PS can't wait for the baby to come. Oh my goodness. So what is COSC right now? The, is that the special counsel? I, I don't know what that acronym is. I'm having a brain freeze. Fact finding instead of legal review. What is that one, Brandon Lesko? Is that the special uh, COSC? What the heck is that? Colorado Supreme Court? Is it the, oh, that's probably what it is. Colorado Supreme Court is what I'm guessing, but I typed it into Google and it's not that at all. Uh, I'm not sure what that says. Anyways, so, well, that's a good question, Brandon. I think that they were re, you know, I didn't really review it for that. I, when I was reading it, I thought that they were just kind of reinterpreting what Colorado had found but you're right. I mean, they, they did their digging, like they did their, their unpacking. They disagreed with the lower level court. I don't know. I think the whole opinion is reprehensible. We'll see what the Supreme court says. And we can't wait for your baby to come either. Brandon, thanks for being here. Nitin kitten says Trump responded to the SCOTUS J six case. Will you cover that? Yes. We're going to hit that one tomorrow. I did see that one come out, but today was just all Colorado. So Trump did respond at the Supreme Court and Trump, which is, I, I think we predicted that one. Trump was asking for the petition to be denied, right? In other words, Jack Smith cannot leapfrog over the Court of Appeals. And just as we thought, Trump wants to go slow. Just you know, no reason to have this happen right now. No need to petition, Jack. Calm your, your jets, my friend. We're going to go up the Court of Appeals and we'll deal with it in due time. And so that's the basis of the motion we're going to read that tomorrow. Thank you, Nitin. We got Sam in Texas says, don't worry, we will win. I totally agree. Every move they make wakes up more people, but more people, everyone, but progressives have been alienated. They will fail. Lincoln comparisons are very scary. No doubt about that, Sam in Texas. It is scary, man. It's like these people are so, so demented and so twisted that, you know, they're telling their viewers on MSNBC every day that Trump is hate Adolf reincarnated. So talk about stochastic terrorism or something like that. Not even that I believe in that, but it's almost like they're kind of incentivizing their people to take out Hitler. You know what I mean? Which is a, not a good thing. So Sam in Texas, I agree. I think that these judges reveal themselves. Okay. When people are immoral or, um, dishonest when they're cheating, when they have to do stuff like this, they, they have to do it, right? That's the downside to being a cheater. 
is you have to cheat. That's the downside to being a liar is you got to lie. And when you do those things, we all get to see it. You know, we get to, we can tell, we can just sniff it out. And so we get to see it. They're, they're all on display. I agree with you. I think people feel like even if they don't like Trump, that it's cheating to take him off the ballot. And I don't think people like to be in bed with cheaters unless you're Democrats. Barb's loves Alaska says, Rob, two questions, Rob. One, when is SCOTUS expected to rule on this Colorado clown show? Unknown, no answer, anybody's guess. Two, can SCOTUS come back sooner than what date is expected? Again, same question. SCOTUS, it's all all just predictive, right? People are just guessing. There's really, SCOTUS can do whatever it wants. It's SCOTUS. So they can, you know, they can reject it, say, no, no, we're not interested right now. They could accept it and schedule arguments whenever they want. It's SCOTUS. So everybody's just kind of predicting. We're all just waited, waiting with bated breath, unfortunately. There's not, you know, like with other, with other courts of appeals and things, there are deadlines. Like you got to file an appeal within 14 days or something, you know, whatever the rules are on your, on your local state, there's deadlines for it. But when it goes up to the Supreme Court of the United States, they can decide to accelerate this. They can, you know, they can come out and say, this is ridiculous. Like we don't even want this conversation to be happening over the holiday break, for example, and just accept it and, you know, schedule something or issue a ruling. I mean, they can, they can do whatever they want. We got bad poet says, I have heard J six stories about how the crowd was, let's say, you know, aggravated. Now, how can they put that on a national level? How do dictators take power? Putting down unrest is a way to say something calm. Well, the crowd was, we saw in, in trial testimony and in video evidence, cops shooting projectiles at people's faces who were standing there peacefully in the crowd. And the crowd got agitated because they were being shot at by cops. Were they shooting at other people at other protests? I don't think so. A bad poet. We got Lady Ice in the house says, you know, I think it's a combination of throw pasta on the wall to see what sticks to make him look really bad for independence. But more than that, they are really pushing the outrage injustice buttons. Like they are really hoping that we will get pushed far enough that we will snap and further prove the whole orchestrated insurrection story. I also agree with that. You know, and I think that they're trying to see if they can cause something to happen. I mean, we, we've already seen this play out, right? I'm not making this up. They, they piggyback off of each other. With Michael Sussman, they fed fake stories to the FBI, then fed those fake stories to the media. And they tried to create something that wasn't there. With, well, basically everything else we cover, they do that same thing. And so here, if they can cause anything to happen, man, it's going to be insurrection 2.0 and they're going to have a meltdown. Object class Keters here says the more, this more and more seems like 1860 Democrats trying to get rid of the Republican candidate while have multiple Democrat candidates and calling the Republicans radicals. Yeah. And while being the, the actual racists and bigots in the country, right? Actually being the party who was fighting on behalf of keeping slaves by many, you know, interpretations of this. And so it is curious that we are going through this repetition where they're trying to wreck and divide the country and we're trying to save it and cobble it, hold it together. We got Pinochet says, I'm curious why the DOJ didn't go all out on J6 cases. That's news to me. Are they still holding back? As far as I'm concerned, they've called it the biggest investigation in American history. Feels like they have nothing else going on. In fact, everything else is in, in total disarray because they're only focusing on the J6 cases. So maybe Pinochet, you were being sarcastic and I just missed it. B-Man says, Schumer is already calling for Thomas to recuse himself. That's not a surprise. They'll blame the Supreme Court as well. And then Ray K says, what makes everyone so sure SCOTUS will take this up? I think they will, but I'm not 100% sure. I know that they dropped the ball on the interference during the election. And that's a great point. They definitely did not accept any of that during the election. And so my friends, those are the great comments over from our friends at Rumble, watchingthewatchers.locals.com and our friends on the YouTubes. 
Let's say hello to our friends on X before we go over to a very short members only after party because we are so out of time. I lost track of the clock. We got some comments here. We got George is over on the X platform. We got Al Holman. We got Stofers. Goofy for Jesus is over there. We got JB Feline Fun says, is there any recourse for Colorado? They said that they might do something about it. We'll see. Emery says, thanks for a great show. I look forward to it, says Trump is alpha. M Money says, Rob, will SCOTUS have to rule? And uh, we'll see. We'll continue to follow those. Viva had a good take on it. Fred's here. James Pepper's here. We got a Constitution link here. We got another Menza member. And of course, Danny McWilliams is over there on the X platform. We're making it real quick today, our friends on X, because we got to jump. But that... My friends, is it for us on the day. Don't forget to check out robertgovea.com slash shop to get your brand new hat. And we love our latest gear. We're super excited to have our gear. I wear this puppy every day. It's my daily driver. And we have watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our after party, which is where we're going now. I want to say thank you to our friends who mod down the fort for us, including Don, Donut Mind Me, Dog Digger, Janek, John Allen, Zach Nichols, Beyond Geo, Zulu, Ronnie Cole, Playin' Hooky, Just Cause, K Bean, and of course, our friend who clipped away hard for us today, Vianti Kiss Prime. Also want to thank our mods and our meme smith, Sleepy Dog League, Jigam Gigam, and Nathan N810. But that, my friends, is it! For us on the day. Thanks for checking out robertgovea.com to grab a hat, support the show, and sign up for our daily newsletter. That is going to be it for us on the day. We are going to wrap it up right there, heading on over to Locals. But my friends, if we don't see you there, we hope to see you right back here so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.